Okay, so uh, we're going to get started. Uh, and actually, the first order of business is to swear in our new council members. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Right. Otherwise, I'm like, I should see these shoes. They're awesome. They are awesome. Okay. All right. Do you solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office of counselor for the city of Montpelier and will therein do equal right and justice to all people to the best of your judgment and abilities according to law? So help you God. Uh, and also, do you solemnly swear that you will be true and faithful to the state of, Mont uh, state of Vermont and that you will not directly or indirectly do any act or thing injurious to the constitution thereof? as established by convention, so help you God. I do. Okay, so firm. <laughs> do you solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office of the Council of the City of Montpelier and will therein do equal right and justice to all people to the best of your judgment and abilities according to laws, uh, and also uh, solemnly swear that you will be true and faithful to the state of Vermont uh, and will not directly or indirectly do any act or thing injurious to the Constitution thereof as established by convention, so help you God. Yeah, I so do. firm. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to uh, welcome um, Councillor, Councillors Jack and Ashley uh, back and welcome Lauren um, to the council. Yay. So glad to have you. Glad to have all of you. Okay. So we are going to um, uh, call the meeting to order. Uh, so the first uh, item is to review and approve the agenda, and I don't think that there are any changes or have been any proposed changes. So uh, I'm going to consider the, cons uh, the, uh, the agenda approved without objection. Um, next is general business and appearances, uh, which is a time for uh, any member of the public to address the council on any uh, issue that is otherwise not on our agenda. And uh, if anyone wants to uh, say anything, now is a great time to do it. Uh, if you'd state your name and uh, where you're from, and then also try to keep your comments to two minutes or less. And that's true for um, any other further comments um, on the rest of the meeting. So welcome. Hi, my name is Ian Quinlan. I'm, uh, I'm from Montpelier, uh, currently living in the first district. Uh, the reason why I come for the council today is for a reconsideration for the next year, uh, the parking ban for Elm Street. Uh, the parking ban on Elm Street I find uh, this year, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, snow removers and drain cleaners have uh, only appeared twice this calendar year. Uh, there's a lot of public housing who do not have easy access to off street parking or available parking. I know many people along that stretch who currently have to make arrangements with either friends or families far away. Uh, traveling by foot across the city is a very difficult uh, endeavor in some parts of the city, especially during some cold years where we have a lot of icing. Uh, I myself have had to have uh, in-laws stay at hotels because I, we don't have, have the accommodations for them to be able to park off street nearby our house. Um, I believe that the majority of Elm Street residents would be able and willing to uh, accommodate the current restrictions of uh, monitoring the city's requirements for off street when uh, snowstorms are there or when snow removal needs to be done. Um, so I do believe that we would be able to be beneficial to the residents of that area um, to have the snow removal be reconsidered um, for us to be able to be able to park when there is no immediate emergency for snow removal and there's no immediate time when snow removal is going to be uh, done. Can I ask you a couple of follow-up questions? Sure. So um, uh, being unfamiliar um, with Elm Street's uh, you know, situation with the parking pen, so is it, it's one of these streets that it's always banned? Yes. And, uh, and is it the entire length or is it just a portion? Uh, from the best of my knowledge, it is from Spring, Spring Street to State Street. Okay. And so that's the portion that you would hope would be sort of in the rest of the mix of like uh, only having a, a ban um, when there's a snow event or when yes. there's removal needs to happen. Yes. Okay. I just add to that that we're going to have a parking ban debrief on an agenda probably in April or May because issues that we want to share with the council. We've been doing it for three or four years now and we, you know talk about what's working and what isn't working. So this is something we can add into the consideration. 
So there'll be a, a council agenda item in, in, in April general, or May? About the parking ban in general, okay. yes. So we'll certainly keep that in mind and um, love to have you, you know, come we'll make sure if you want. On the list <laughs> yeah. of things. We'll, we'll advocate for it um, here as well, but um, hopefully. I would love to return okay. when you guys are, have that on the agenda. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. I want to commend that with uh, significant badgering, we've made huge progress on keeping the drains clear and the sidewalks unflooded, uh, especially the ponding in the crosswalks that freezes. Uh, I, I rarely get a chance to compliment. So. <laughs> we'll take it. Thank you. So uh, on the parking, I want to absolutely uh, second or support the prior comments. Uh, and I noticed uh, Baldwin Street. It's like a seasonal no parking, but it's of necessity. There's a dozen cars that park there. I'm just saying, we're, we're, we we those signs should be removed because except when snow removal emergencies get, get them out of here, but to in fact turn a blind eye to posted signs is counterproductive. Um, in the next day or two we're at a critical point in house transportation of a very close vote on whether they move forward with a feasibility study for train service, passenger train mm -hmm. service through Montpelier. Mm -hmm. um, the Agency of Transportation is complaining that they don't want to put 85,000 in a consultant to do it. It might trigger positive train control, which would mean retrofitting the blood cars. But my point is that this is, I think we're remiss in not account, in accounting for train travel in our multimodal transit center, and we have an opportunity to do a little bit of penance here and get help support this feasibility study because passenger rail with cars that are already owned and available here in, on this track between what the, the junction and Barry would help the whole state. It would be a significant demonstration project for the feasibility of passenger rail. It would also alleviate or demonstrate uh, the lesser need for uh, <coughs> albatross parking garages. <laughs> uh, Steve, you. what bill is that? This is, we, it's, uh, uh, I hadn't heard about this. Bill. It's in transportation, but okay. I spoke to the chair today, and okay. it's a close vote. Okay. And the <coughs> city has not Stepped yeah. up I haven't heard about it till yeah. just now. So um, I'm gonna e I'm about to email you to ask like uh, who, you know who are the right people to um, the two swing yeah. votes, or, or like the <laughs> committee chair. Or, committee chair. I'll, I'll send you an email and Kurt McCormick. okay. Oh, I know Kurt. Uh, okay, and, but he's running out of time to get more witnesses. And Vtrans was in today, um, but I, th I think you all ought to write the swing votes. Um, yeah. Tim Corker and Dave Potter. Okay. and just say this is important to Montpelier and Central Vermont and we're your host for four months out of the year so give us a break and help us create alleviate parking and Great. get you to the state of it. Uh, Steve my understanding was B-Trans actually supported the study today in committee right? Supported it with a caveat mm -hmm. that they would have to hire a consultant it was a it okay. was less than a, 100% less than 100% it could huh. easily die and now is not the time when yeah. so many other ducks are already in a row. Yeah, well, we thank you very so much for uh, immediate action. Yeah, keep, uh, keeping us, uh, you know, apprised of that. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay. All right, on to the consent agenda. Uh, is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? I move the consent agenda. Second. Uh, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so the consent agenda passes. So if anybody was here for the street closure application for the Muddy Onion, the Farmer's Market, or a liquor license, that just passed. <laughs> you don't have to rush off. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, on to some orientation. Uh, well, I don't have a, a lot for orientation. Actually, I was, um, had intended for that to be the very first thing, but I would note that we have the new 2019 handbooks on your desk. So they, they 
it's very similar to the ones you've had in the past, but we do update them each year with uh, current information and any changes that we know about. So again, I <coughs> urge you to go through these. It, it, you know, even some of you that have been on for a few years, it's good to reread this and just uh, remind ourselves. And, and if there's anything that it says in here that we're doing that we're not doing, then we should either change the book or change our practices. So we'll do that. I think more importantly, last year we did a huge series of site visits with um, three new council members and a couple other council members that were first year. We, we I, I know Lauren would like to do that this year. Didn't know if everybody wanted to be involved. or um, My thought was maybe we just schedule her and let you all know if people want to do a refresher when she's going. Um, rather than, but what, what are your thoughts on that? I'd definitely go to some because I missed a couple last year. Okay, so. and likewise. All right. Um, Donna, yeah. Yes, interested in sharing. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. If I can go, I, I would jump in, but maybe not make it to all of them. Um, I'm particularly interested in getting in time to visit the pool. We didn't visit the pool oh, last right. year. I would also like to do an update on the water resource recovery. Oh, yeah. Just to, to kind of get a sense now for knowing that the project is moving forward and like right kind of so like it is it's um you know it's all bid I think they're just waiting for spring for construction they're right. doing all the final details and f still get some funding packages in but I'll ask for um, an update on that as okay. well plus it's the most informative one that I've done <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay we should do the pool in like July. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, Bill and Ashley, you need to talk in your mics more. I'm here and I can't hear you. Maybe they can, but okay. okay. It, it, when you turn your head, you miss it. It's just a fussy mic. Thank you. I will. I will do my best to be louder. People don't. People usually tell me to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we will. Uh, anyway. So as, as far as orientation goes. Uh, we will schedule site visits with Council Member Hurl and let you all know when and where they're happening, and anyone can hop on if they like. Got a plan? Yep. All right. Okay. Um, uh, <coughs> excuse me. On to the ethics policy. So this is a document. <coughs> excuse me. That we approve every year, um, just affirming the uh, basically the rules of conduct that we are going to abide by. Um, any thoughts, amendments, questions, objections? There yes, Jack. There are no changes from uh, previous years in no. the draft that we have now. Although you, you all could make them if you liked, but there are none. Okay. Um, we can, uh, if there are no um, suggestions, we should probably have a motion to approve them. I move to approve them. What I'll do you say? Second it. Yeah, no, that's great. That's fine. Can I... And there was a second. Oh, yes, Can question. I just ask a, a sort of general question? I mean, my assumption is, although I just want to make sure that this is not an erroneous assumption, um, is that we just put forward, like, for example, I'm a prosecutor, so things in, involving law enforcement, I, do I need, should I just raise that every time so that, or, or what's the sort of preference? Uh, I think probably just every I would I would assume you know every time it comes up as a topic you okay. preface it and I I mean unless you stand to make money on on or uh, if you have a direct or, conflict or I couldn't be objective yes. for some reason right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, sure that I just wanted to make sure we I like I like to know what expectations are so as long as right yep fair enough uh, so there was a motion and a second um, is there any further discussion uh, all in favor please say aye aye, aye. 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 opposed okay. Thank you all. Uh, all right. Oh, and so now uh, we need to uh, elect some officers. So, oh, there's a procedure. Wait a minute. Oh, oh, I did skip that one. Thank you. Rules of procedure. So again, this is just uh, how we're going to operate our, conduct our meetings. I move that we adopt the rules of procedure as uh, proposed and as adopted in previous years. Second. Second. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. All right, now on to um, electing officers. Um, so we need um, someone to be president, vice president, and parliamentarian 
uh, for the city council. Uh, one hypothesis is that people are interested in what they were interested that if you know what they were um, uh, if they were interested in those offices again. That you know that's one possibility. Or if there's other people who are interested in those offices, that's fine too. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm wondering if if it might be helpful to just sort of explain. Like, I know that there's oh, like a super sure. basic Thank you. like explanation, but <coughs> sure. So um, the uh, council president uh, leads the council discussion uh, if I am absent, and then the vice president leads council procedures and discussions uh, if both the mayor and the president are are absent, and the parliament parliamentarian. Uh, helps us clarify uh, when we have procedural questions. Um, the, other, the other role of the president and yes. less frequently the vice president, but in the event that there's a public event or something and the, the mayor can't make it, then often the, the council president will step in to represent the city as the top elected official. Uh, Glenn? And remind me, Ashley, you were president last year, is yes. that correct? Mm -hmm. And can't remember who was vice president. I think it was Rose. Donna, and oh, was Rosie, Rosie was parliamentarian. the parliamentarian? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Anybody like one of those positions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, Jack. I would volunteer to be parliamentarian. Okay. Oh yes. No oh, nominations. I nominate Jack McCullough to be parliamentarian. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else like to be parliamentarian? Anybody else want to nominate someone else to be parliamentarian? <laughs> no? Uh, I guess we'll just take it one one step at a time then. Uh, all right, all in favor of Jack being the parliamentarian? Oh, there was there there was not a motion. Wait, did you I make nominated. He nominated. Did you accept? A second. Uh, I'll second a sec it. A second is not me. required Still for uh, nomination. Okay. okay. Oh, he's hey, crushing it already. <laughs> <laughs> You're not it's supposed to start yet. <laughs> it's a new era That's now. Good. That's excellent. <laughs> this is Odom's the, not here to contradict. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't the only organization I'll be parliamentary yeah, there you for. Go. That's good. And Donna, you seconded. I did. But we don't need it. But we don't, but need, we don't a need a second. We don't need it. Okay. Second was overruled. Okay. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> Do you accept? Uh, sorry, I missed. It. I missed that part. Great. Um, okay. So, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. All right. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, I'll nominate Ashley for president. Do you accept? I accept. Okay. <laughs> Apparently, we don't need a second. Uh, further discussion or other nominations? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you. Congratulations. Um, vice President. I'd like to nominate Donna to be Vice President. Okay. okay. You're up to the okay. task. Yeah. <laughs> I got to do two meetings. Yeah, it was good. It was good. <laughs> Everybody's wiped out. So, yeah. <laughs> so you're accepting? Sure. Okay. All right. Um, any other nominations? Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. Thank you and congratulations. Uh, excellent. Okay, so uh, to get us up to speed uh, with open meeting law, we have um, Garrett Baxter. Garrett Baxter, thank you from uh, Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Welcome. Hi. I, I assume you a have second. a. Yeah, he is. We're okay. just gonna get fired up here. Okay, I'm gonna remove myself. It did work earlier, right? We saw it working. We're good whenever you want to go. Oh, all set? Okay, yeah. great. Sorry about that. Nope. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Up here. 
Right. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Garrett Baxter. I'm senior staff attorney for the Vermont League of Cities and Towns Municipal Assistance Center. Um, if you're not familiar with the league, um, we're an independent nonprofit corporation. We are not affiliated with the state. We um, are not a general clearinghouse of legal information. We are a member services organization comprised of all 250 municipalities in Vermont. And the department I work in, which is the Municipal Assistance Center, or MAC for short, is comprised of six professionals uh, with diverse backgrounds in municipal law, public management, municipal research, and water quality. Um, and collectively, we provide local officials such as yourselves with education, training, and professional assistance uh, that you need to carry out your statutory duties. Uh, in addition to conducting day-long and on-site training such as this one, on various topics of municipal law and governance, governance we primarily uh, fulfill this role by answering your questions over the phone or via email Monday through Friday, 8, 8.30 to 4 o'clock. Um, the contact information should be on the inside jacket of your packets, which everyone should have in front of you. Um, and we can answer any questions regarding your roles and responsibilities as municipal officials. So. And because the other two attorneys and myself have an attorney-client relationship uh, with our municipal members, we cannot give assistance or advice to those whose interests may not align with our clients. And as such, we do not answer questions from the general public. Fortunately, there are other entities in the state that provide assistance and information to members of the public about municipal issues. Uh, the Secretary of State's office just created an office a couple years ago. Uh, a director of municipal assistance uh, who can be reached at 802-828-1027. Okay. And I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not. You might have seen the Secretary of State's um, uh, op-ed in Vermont Digger, but this week is Sunshine Week. And if you're not familiar, it's a national celebration of access to public information and government transparency. Um, so this is a great time to go over understanding the open meeting law. Um, for those reasons, this presentation is going to be for general education purposes only and does not and shouldn't be construed as constituting legal advice or creating a client, attorney client relationship with anyone. So with those pleasantries <laughs> dispensed with, um, I'm here to talk to you again about Vermont's open meeting law. Uh, and in your packets, you'll have a copy of the presentation on the right hand side. And on the left hand side, I put some material that is available on our website at vlct.org. The first one is a quick guide to Vermont's open meeting law. It's intended to be just a reference sheet that you can have at a meeting uh, to see if you're complying with the law. The but next this has been great to give to oh, people, great. to our committees. Very, very helpful. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, our next one is the open meeting law FAQs, which this presentation pretty much tracks. Um, so. We try to anticipate questions that particularly new members would have um, about the open meeting law, um, and it's a deeper dive into the subject. We also have the same materials for the public records law as well available on our website. We have model rules of procedure for municipal boards, committees, and commissions. Um, we also have model response forms uh, if there is a open meeting law complaint uh, waged against uh, city council or any other public body of the municipality. And I'll just jump in here quickly and say that league guide is on page 72 of the handbook. That you That's great. Just <coughs> so Vermont's open meeting law requires that all public bodies have agendas, so we're going to do the same. And here's our agenda for the evening. These are all the questions that we're going to hopefully answer tonight for you and discuss in the hopes that you'll have a better understanding of what the open meeting law is and how it works. So before we start, I just wanted to let you know that you can access the open meeting law uh, at the legislature.vermont.gov slash statutes. And where you want to look online is in Title I, Chapter 5, Subchapter 2. Okay. Law can also be found in your green books in Title I, Section 310 through 314. So really, we're only talking about four sections here. Um, but they're very important sections. So the first question we're going to ask is, just start off simply, what is the open meeting law? And broadly speaking, 
Uh, it controls and regulates meetings of public bodies. It does this by establishing certain minimum standards for meetings, including keeping meetings open and accessible uh, to the public as a means of ensuring government accountability. And that brings up why we have the open meeting law in the first place. The open meeting law clearly emphasizes the openness and, uh, and accessibility to government, and the law is rooted in Chapter 1, Article 6 of the Vermont Constitution, which states that all power being originally inherent in and consequently derived from the people, therefore all officers of government, whether legislative or executive, are their trustees and servants, and at all times in a legal way accountable to them. So what that's saying is the goal, of account, the goal of the law is accountability, and the tool that we use to achieve accountability is transparency. When government decisions and the processes used to reach them are transparent, that enables the people to hold their public officers accountable. So the law then is meant to empower the public to play an effective role not only as an active participant in government, but as a check on it as well. So the Vermont Supreme Court has answered the question of why we have the open meeting law uh, this way. It has said that the purpose of the open meeting law is to give public exposure to government decision making. So we have the open meeting law in short to hold you, the government, accountable for the decisions you make and the actions that you take. In order to ensure that the open meeting law is used for the purpose for which it's intended, the Vermont Supreme Court has said that it's entitled to a liberal construction in support of the goal of open access to public meetings for members of the public, exemptions to these laws must be strictly construed. What this means is that when there's any question as to whether the open meeting law applies or not, or whether its requirements have to be adhered to, the courts will always err on the side of transparency and access to public meetings. So to that point, our office tends to give the most conservative legal advice uh, when, it be, when it comes to this or other laws because it's our job as attorneys at BLCT not only to give you the advice, advice that will help you win in court, but hopefully give you the advice that will help keep you out of court in the first place. So keep that in mind that our advice as we go through this and questions will come up and you're going to ask why can't we do this, we're going to give the cautious conservative approach. Yeah. Now that we know what the law is and why we have it, next question is who does it apply to? and it applies to every public body in the municipality. What's a public body? <coughs> it encompasses all boards, councils, commissions, committees of a political subdivision of a state, which is a reference to municipalities, and includes all cities, towns, fire districts, and other governmental units. So, I may use the words public body here and board interchangeably as we go along, but they mean the same thing. So the law covers two groups of public bodies. The first consists of any statutory public body. In other words, those that are explicitly mentioned in the green books, okay? such as these listed here. And then we also have a second group of public bodies, which includes any of those created by any one of those statutory uh, public bodies mentioned in the law. So if the city council, for instance, creates a committee to assist it with whatever objective it's trying to carry out, that committee that it creates will be a public body and will have to adhere to the requirements of the open meeting law. Same with the cemetery commission or the board of civil authority, the development review board, any other statutory body. Yes? Um, a question on that last one. Uh, public body committee and subcommittee. Can, can you describe a little bit what constitutes a subcommittee? Yep, and here we're just referencing a public body that's been created by another public body that has been created by a statutory public body. So if the city council creates uh, a committee, that committee creates a subcommittee, that the board also is required to adhere to the open meeting law. Um, and what degree of formality does the subcommittee uh, need to be created with? So for example, say a committee uh, says, okay, uh, Ashley, Jack, and Lauren, we need this specific thing done before our next meeting. Can you three go do that before the next meeting? Is that a subcommittee? What I would do is make it explicit in your minutes whether or not a subcommittee is being created or not. 
oftentimes how this happens um, is that people will come forward, make a proposal, um, a board may respond by saying, well, it'd be great if you could um, find that information out and get back to us. Okay. Um, so you want to differentiate in your minutes whether or not you're um, creating a committee or whether you're just asking for assistance from maybe a concerned group, a group of concerned citizens. So I think the more explicit in your minutes, uh, the less confusion there will be as to whether you're creating a public body or not. And especially in a larger municipality like Montpelier, um, when that happens, it can be easy to lose track of just how many public bodies you have. Yes. Well, likewise, along with what Glenn was asking, does it matter the number, whether it's under a quorum or not? No, so for, there is a law that I'll get into in a second uh, that talks about uh, when joint authority is provided uh, to three or more. Um, so typically boards that are created are three members. Okay? Uh, so if you're gonna create a committee um, or a subcommittee, you'd wanna have at least three members for that board. And in that, what you would want to do is you can do it by motion or resolution um, and include for the creation of that public body their charge. What it is, what's, why are we creating you, what we want to, you to accomplish, um, and probably also give them uh, material regarding the open meeting law to let them know that they're going to have to comply with it. So, and I'm thinking of committees themselves who mm -hmm. often have working groups, mm -hmm. and two or three people may say, we'll work together and come up with this spreadsheet for everyone. And so it's not a specific committee, but they're going to work, and the language in the minutes yep. says they're going to work on this issue. Yep, and that's, and that's fine, so long as, and I see where you're going with your question now, so long as they don't constitute a quorum of the board. Okay. Uh, so with the city council, you have a board of seven, you don't want to create a subcommittee of four right. uh, for yeah. that purpose. If what you're doing, I'm sorry, is not creating a subcommittee, but just right. having members Work, get to work together to uh, bring something to the board at a later meeting because okay. we'll get into quorums in a second. Okay, thank you. Right. So when does the open meeting law apply? <coughs> the open meeting applies whenever a public body is holding a meeting. And what is a meeting? A meeting is a gathering of the quorum of the members of the public body for the purpose of discussing the business of the public body or for the purpose of taking action. So there are two conditions, both of which must be met in order to constitute a meeting and to trigger the requirements of the open meeting law. First, there has to be a quorum of the public body present. And second, that quorum of the public body has to be gathered to discuss the business of the public body or to take action. So what exactly constitutes business of the public body? Until this last legislative session, we didn't know. There wasn't a definition in the law. And with the passage of Act 166, we finally got some clarification. So it now means uh, the public body's governmental functions, including any matter over which the public body has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power. How do you know what that is? Well, for statutory public bodies, you're going to mostly find that, again, in the green books. It's going to spell out in statute what your responsibilities are as a public body. And for appointed bodies, you want to look in the minutes or the resolution uh, from the board that created you in the resolution, as I spoke earlier, to there being a charge for what that subcommittee is going to, uh, what their objective is going to be. That would be the business of that public body. But discussing the business of the public body on its own doesn't trigger, trigger the open meeting law. Uh, there can be no meeting without a quorum. So what is a quorum? The word isn't defined in the law. So when that happens, we try to figure it out just like a court does. And here, the Supreme, Vermont Supreme Court tells us that words that aren't defined are given their plain and ordinary meaning, which can be done by looking to the dictionary. So the dictionary defines a quorum as the number of members of a group required to be present to transact business legally, usually a majority. So in our context, a quorum is both the minimum number of members you're going to need to hold a meeting and also the minimum number of members you're going to need to take any action. It's also the threshold at which the open meeting law is going to be triggered. So unless the law says otherwise, and for some boards it does, <clears throat> this number is going to be a simple majority, 50% plus one of the total membership of the body. 
So any action taken by less than a quorum will not be valid. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, this definition comports with the definition found in Montpelier's Municipal Governance Charter, which says that a quorum consisting of a majority or four council members is necessary to conduct any business. So what does this all mean? For a seven member board, it means that at least four members, which constitutes a majority, will be needed to hold the meeting. And this is uh, frequently referred to as a bare quorum because the same number, at least four, will have to agree to take any action as a board. And that's because there's a law that states, when joint authority is given to three or more, the concurrence of a majority of such number shall be sufficient and shall be required in its exercise. Now, <clears throat> the standard that a majority of the total membership of the board has to agree to take any action will apply regardless of whether there are board members that abstain, whether they recuse themselves, or whether there are any vacancies on the board. And that's because what's controlling here with respect to determining what your quorum size is, is not the number of members who actually show up, but rather the number of seats at your table. So at your table for the city council, it's a seven member city council, it's always going to be four. If there were seven vacancies on the city council, quorum mount would always be four. Is Any that, questions on Is that also true? Are you going to talk later about committees? This applies to committees as well. This applies to all public bodies, the standard. So recently, being at one of those committees, mm -hmm. and there's actually more vacancies, there's vacancies. So there are seats, but they're not people filling it. And what's the total membership of the board? It was 11. It was 11. And how many um, occupied <coughs> seats does it have now? Nine. Actually, eight. Okay. So you have 50% plus one. Of the eight or the 11? Well, of the 11. So <laughs> okay. that's what I'm saying. You always yeah. want to count the seats, and you have 11 seats at that table. Okay. Unless the board that creates it alters the membership. So if you do run into a situation where um, it's getting difficult to fill seats on a particular board, the board that created it could always alter the membership of that board depending on what it is. It would have to okay. go back to the city council to... to depending it's a, on what it's the public body is. the city council that created it, so yeah. they would have to amend it. Right. Okay. So, if you recall from a couple slides back, a meeting is defined under the law as a gathering a quorum of the members of a public body for the purpose of discussing the business of the public body or for the purpose of taking action. But this gathering doesn't have to be a physical one. The open meeting law explicitly permits members of the public body to meet without actually being physically present. So it provides, as long as the requirements of the law are met, one or more members of a public body may attend a regular special emergency meeting by electronic or other means without being physically present at a designated location and can fully participate by discussing the business of the body and voting to take action. So the law allows a member of a public body and members to attend meetings by electronic means so long as certain conditions are met. And those conditions are that someone participating remotely has to identify him or herself when the meeting is convened and must be able to hear the conduct of the meeting and must be able to be heard by the members at the meeting. And additionally, all votes that are not unanimous have to be conducted by roll call. You can even have a quorum or more of a public body participate electronically in a meeting. So say, for example, all of you happen to be in Florida for Red Sox spring training this, <laughs> this spring. You could all do that, still have a meeting, participate electronically. So for that to happen, the same three conditions that we just went over have to be met. But in addition, the agenda for the meeting has to designate at least one physical location where a member of the public can attend and participate in the meeting, which makes sense because if you're all not going to be here, the public is, needs a place to come and listen to you. And at least one member of the public body, a member of the staff or designee of the public body has to be present at that location. That way they can facilitate the meeting, take care of any technical issues that may arise. Um. And just to check on that, I imagine the physical location would have to be somewhere within the city limits. We couldn't say that the meeting was at spring training in Florida. The law doesn't actually state, but that's how I would read it as. Yes. 
because again, the what <laughs> what we're we're trying to, and I'll come back to this point several times during the presentation, but we're trying to facilitate public access to government decision making. So. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be the same location. You can change the location in town, but then that would be a special meeting, and we'll get into that in a minute. Now, I don't know about you, but I learned best from examples, so I put a couple together, um, some <laughs> possible scenarios that you yourselves may find yourselves in to illustrate what we just went over. So the first deals with a seven-member board and three members who are physically present at the meeting and a fourth member who's attending by conference call. And the question is whether or not this is a meeting. What are they talking about? Well, we'll just say for uh, this scenario that they're discussing the business of the public body. It's then a great yes. question. Yes. The answer is yes. We have one, both a quorum of the members of the public body, four gathered, and two, they're presumably there to discuss the board business or to take action. And because we only have one member participating electronically by conference call, all that's required is that that member identify him or herself at the beginning of the meeting and that he or she can hear the conduct of the meeting and be heard throughout. Now, we're going to complicate things a little more. Here we have a seven-member board with the same three members physically present in the same meeting room. But instead of the fourth member participating by conference call, he or she sends an email or text message to one of the members in attendance expressing his or her position about the meeting and how they want to vote. Can they participate that way? No. 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 Great. It would be part of the public record, though. Well, so the law governing electronic participation requires, and we'll get into that in a second, not only that a member has to identify him or herself, uh, but also that they, they have to hear and be heard throughout the meeting which isn't possible, obviously, if they're participating by email or text message. Okay. Here's the third one. We'll have fun with this one. That, is it assumed that, that they're emailing because they can't hear? Uh, like, no, it is not. Okay. Okay. Um, but, and just as background, yes, the uh, open meeting law does require um, uh, the compliance with uh, Vermont's Public Accommodations Act. So does that mean if I send an email saying, Anne, I can't hear, from that point on, my emails will be recognized as an active participation? No. Oh. So unless it's an accommodation for a disability, and that gets into kind of a, a different like fact-specific analysis, um, you still need to, um, to hear and to be heard if you're participating electronically. So my take would be is if we got an email from you saying I can't hear, we would try to fix the technical issue so that right. you could hear. Otherwise yes. Would be, we would otherwise we would have right. a quorum. Right, exactly. So you would lose the quorum. There's a possibility that when you have, say, a bare quorum of four and three physically present and one attending, say, by teleconference, um, there you have a technical difficulty. Okay? You could lose the quorum at which case you want to resolve that technical issue until you come back and then restart discussion of municipal business. So it has to be a pre-existing condition already accommodated for it. When you're talking about a... To allow an email or text would have to be already set up if that was needed. Well, there you can notify someone that you're having technical difficulties because you have no other way to communicate with them. So that would be permissible. So that's, that's fine. I think he's talking about if someone has a legitimate hearing disability. That's what I was saying. Yeah. So if I had a legitimate hearing disability, I'd have to s establish that ahead of time. And we would have yes. and then be and allowed. You have to, and right, okay. and then we have to address what a reasonable yep. accommodation would be. But, but I don't think just emailing would be sufficient. I think that there'd have to be some way through the leap relay service or something so that the person who can't hear would be able to see text, you know, see all the comments of, of all the members converted to text and be able to do the same thing in response so that the, and the absent person somehow gets everything that everyone said. Right. And that's actually addressed in uh, the ADA has a guide for small towns uh, that I would uh, address um, to your attention. Also, they do have, uh, if such an issue does come up, um, they do have uh, ADA specialists um, who assist callers with compliance with the ADA as well. Okay. 
So we're going to have fun with this last one. We have the same seven-member board, three members this time, who are walking together on the street, talking about the condition <laughs> of the sidewalk. One of the three calls a fourth member to fill him or her in on the discussion. The fourth member who is called, put on speakerphone, doesn't talk, just listens. Is this a meeting? Well, you yeah. added a yeah, fact. Yeah, I was going to say, my, you changed the fact. My, my answer to, to scenario three was, was no, but now that we know that the person's on speakerphone, the right. answer is yes. Great. Yes. That's, that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and again, that's because we have a gathering of a quorum of the members discussing the business of the public body. Um, and the open meeting law doesn't demand active participation. So just because a member is silent uh, and isn't um, not actively participating in the discussion, he or she can still be counted toward the quorum. Okay. But if that same scenario happened, and when someone called another member, didn't put them on speaker and just said, well, Joe says such and such. We're going to get into that. Okay. Yep. So <laughs> what if this fourth member wasn't on speakerphone? Would it still be a meeting? No. So that brings us back to, our, our, back to our last example with the text message or email. The law says a member can only participate electronically if the member can hear what's going on and be heard in turn. So if they can't participate, is there still a meeting? And if there's no meeting, can there be a violation of the open meeting law? <laughs> right. That's, I'm going to give you the lawyer response. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> where I spent all that money at law school for. So these are the questions of first impression, meaning they haven't been definitively answered by the Vermont Supreme Court. There's still many gray areas to the open meeting law, and this is one of them. Our advice, which I told you earlier was admittedly conservative, is to stay away from that type of situation altogether. Why? Because the more you tread in those gray areas, the more you expose yourselves and the city to liability. So in some states, this wouldn't be a question. For example, in Indiana, there's no majority of a, if there's no majority of a um, public body gathered together physically in one location, then it isn't considered a gathering and wouldn't constitute a meeting for the purposes of the open meeting law. In Vermont, however, members can meet without being physically present, but they have to do so in the manner that's prescribed by law. So when questions like these come up, we always go back to the intent behind the law, which is to ensure that conversations and decisions by public bodies are made in public. Okay? In our opinion, any communications not contemplated by the law that would permit public bodies to accomplish what they otherwise couldn't, unless, unless in the context of a duly warned open meeting, violate the spirit if also not the letter of the law. So the Vermont Supreme Court has said that the open meeting law protects not only a public's right to know, but also their right to be present, to be heard, and to participate, none of which they'd be able to do in that scenario. So remember, the law is entitled to a liberal construction, interpretation, and in support of the goal of open access to public meetings for members of the public. So whenever you're faced with this type of situation, ask yourself whether what you're doing will ensure that your discussions and decisions will be made public. If you're going to have a discussion about city business and it involves a quorum, make sure that it's done at a meeting. Okay. Yes. This might be coming up, Garrett, and I think sure. I have the answer to it. Yep. Uh, Councilor Bate posts on Facebook, uh, I want to build a huge water slide, you know, <laughs> into the Winooski River. It's sure. going to be great, 100 feet. I chime in. That's yeah, no, fun. that's a great idea. Glenn says, I already have my bathing suit, right? Four of us chime in on Facebook there. Is that an open meeting? So. Violation. <laughs> you have how many members participating? So, four of us. Four of us, okay. Again, that's a situation we would stay away from as well, okay? So the open meeting law doesn't impact the use of social media by individual members. Um, you are all citizens of the United States. You're entitled to exercise your First Amendment rights. Uh, and certainly be able to communicate with your constituents is a fundamental component of a democratic society. Um, and so I don't want to take that away from you. Websites or blogs that are not interactive present the least problems. Interactive sites such as Front Porch Forum or Facebook, um, those that can be used to solicit a response from other members of the public body, however, can present problems as participate, participation of a quorum, again, can constitute a meeting under the open meeting law. And 
a meeting, again, is not limited to those situations where you're physically gathered in one location. So it can be violated if, in our opinion, a quorum of uh, members of the body is discussing business using email or social media applications such as Facebook or Front Porch Forum. So again, our recommendation is that it's generally best to avoid discussions of town business and social media. Again, fairly conservative view, and of course has unfortunate consequences uh, since you won't be as accessible as you'd like. Um, but again, it's our job to give you the advice that will help keep you out of a lawsuit. I guess I'm, I hear what you're saying, yes. but I'm curious why that's, why social media is treated differently than a text message or an email would be like, so, so let's just assume that it is like, it's a social media post and it's, it's whatever. And it, but it, there's no, like, it's just a thread that kind of goes on over a course of 36 hours. What is the difference between a, a text message, like if I text during a meeting because I, you know, because I can't be at the meeting, but I'm watching at home, and you know, Ashley doesn't like something. And, and we would say that there's not a difference if you're involving a quorum of the members of the public body, so that um, four of you shouldn't be involved in a text message or an email discussing the business of a public body. Except okay. in certain limited circumstances that we'll go over. Okay. Hold on, I'm just parsing. Okay, so you're saying what, what your response is, is if I text four or three other people, that's a problem. But, of the but public that, body. So yes. are you saying that the, that, so is it the affirmative action step or is it just simply the sheer number of people that, that the question turns on? It's the, the two requirements uh, behind the open meeting law which is again the quorum, so yes it is the numbers, and then it is what is your dis what it is that you're discussing. If you're discussing the business of the public body, then when you have a quorum of the board discussing the business of the public body, that has to take place in the context of a meeting. Okay. Now the only way that the law contemplates for you to participate electronically is in a manner that you can be heard and the proceedings can be heard by you and you can accomplish that through either email or text so how i guess why like what's the difference between that and social media i'm not trying to well, be dense i'm just and genuinely and trying and to and it's not we would say that this wouldn't be allowed either okay? okay so you could have a situation where a member posts on social media um regarding the municipal charter mm -hmm. and uh jack responds to that um, and then uh, Glenn and Connor um, respond to that as well. Now you have a quorum of members of the public body discussing municipal business, and it's not within the context of a public meeting. Okay. So it hasn't been noticed. It has no agenda. People have an, uh, may have an opportunity to participate, but that's not an opportunity that's open to everyone. Not everyone has access to Facebook, Front Porch Forum is even more limited because it's okay. limited to those um, to, who live there, not to, it's not open to mm -hmm. the general public. There are not minutes taken, okay? okay. Um, so we would recommend refraining from using social media or email to discuss the business of your public body with other board members entirely. Okay. Um, even if you're having an email correspondence um, with less than a quorum membership, then that member could engage another member in the same conversation. And those serial one-to-one -one communications, which again, our court hasn't addressed, um, those postings on social media or front porch forum, those could in the aggregate involve a quorum of the board's membership and constitute a meeting under the law. Okay. So while one posting um, doesn't implicate the open meeting on front porch forum, any subsequent postings could if they trigger that quorum requirement. So just to kind of come to an easy rule of thumb for yeah. at least our group, if, if an individual member wants to post about their feelings about a particular issue, best practice would be the, the rest of them, and I would include myself, would not comment on that person's post. Correct. And just let it, let it play out how it's going to play out. Exactly. Um, and one of, one of the difficulties is is that um, the timing of a member's participation likely is not a factor. Again, that's an issue that the Vermont Supreme Court hasn't addressed. Um, so 
in other states, you have what's called the simultane simultaneity standard, uh, which means that uh, there's only a meeting if everyone can discuss municipal business contemporaneously with one another, okay? We don't have that, and if they don't, if they're not, then it's not a meeting and it's not a violation of their open meeting law. So you could have a text message sent to one that's sent to another, a string of emails or communications, they wouldn't violate their open meeting law. We don't have such an sta explicit standard in our state, so we don't know for certain. But we do know the intent behind the open meeting law, which is to make sure that discuss discussion of municipal business takes place at an open meeting. So taking that intent and viewing those actions in light of the purpose behind the law, we recommend not engaging in that conduct. <coughs> so we'll get into that a little more as well. Okay? And certainly, this is a lot that I'm throwing at you. Um, and uh, feel free, again, to email a call if you have any questions beyond tonight. This won't be your only opportunity. Okay. Now, just coming back to this um, example for a minute, um, this conversation wouldn't be a violation of the open meeting law if the members were, for example, conducting a site visit for the purpose of assessing damage to sidewalks, as that is a statutory exemption under the open meeting law. Okay. So it's not considered um, within the realm of its requirements. So, Bill, did we post our site visits? We I, did, can't, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. okay. And you can, and that's something I want to state. Uh, as well is that you can always go beyond the minimum yeah. that the law requires, which is always a best practice. Okay? So we know when the open meeting law applies, who would actually, um, what does it actually require you to do? Open meeting law has five primary requirements. Your meetings must be publicly noticed. You have to produce an agenda that has to be posted and made available before your meetings. They have to be open to the public you have to provide an opportunity for public comment, and minutes must be taken and posted. Now, one of the key features of the open meeting law is that the business of the public body has to be conducted with few distinct exceptions in the public. The purpose behind the law's public notice requirement is to inform the general public of when and where your meetings will take place so that they can decide whether or not they want to attend. Otherwise, people won't have the opportunity to hear what you have to say and comment on issues that affect their community. So in terms of scheduling, there are three meetings, regular, special, and emergency, and each has their own requirements. Your regular meetings, those are just that. These are your regularly scheduled meetings, which occur at some time, date, and place at regular interviews, intervals. Special meetings are not special because any of the business you're going to uh, conduct or discuss, but because they're held at some date, time, or place other than your regularly scheduled meetings. And your emergency meetings are those that are held only when necessary to respond to some unforeseen uh, occurrence or condition requiring your immediate attention. So regular meetings don't have to be individually noticed. Notice the date, time, and place for these meetings is typically set by resolution at your your first meeting following town meeting, your organizational meeting. Um, it can also be set by charter, ordinance, or bylaw. And this meeting schedule must also be available to any person upon request. And we would recommend posting it some prominent location in the city, uh, if not more locations. Your special meetings, the time, place, and purpose of them has to be publicly announced at least 24 hours prior to the meeting by posting notices in or near the clerk's office in at least two other designated locations, giving oral or written notice to members of the public body unless previously waived. So sometimes at a board's organizational meeting, one of the items on the agenda will be for members to opt out of receiving that notification. Providing notice to any person who had requested written notification of your special meetings and written request of special meetings will only apply in the calendar year in which they're requested, unless they're requested in December, in which case they'll apply to that month and the following year, following calendar year. And also notifying any press, uh, any editor, publisher, news director of a newspaper or radio station that serves your area. 
Emergency meetings can be held without public announcement, without posting notices, and without 24 notice to members, provided that some notice is given prior to the meeting um, as soon as possible. So situation I had with a town was that they had lost their road foreman uh, the night of a blizzard um, and they needed to plow the roads the next day and they had no one. Uh, can we hold an emergency meeting? Well, it's an unforeseen occurrence. Certainly this person just up and quit and it requires their immediate attention. So I said, yeah, I think that meets the standard of emergency meeting. They said, what notice should we provide? Fortunately, the, it was snowing at that time. Fortunately, the person lived relatively close to the, the town hall, said, just write emergency meeting of the select board, the date, the time, slap, just tape it on the door. Law says some notice has to be given before the meeting. That was certainly some notice. So, Emergency meetings are unlike regular and special meetings in that they're topical. So by law, they can only again be held when necessary to respond to an unforeseen occurrence or condition requiring immediate attention. The standard here should be if it can wait 24 hours, then call a special meeting instead. Okay. Uh, it's important to quickly note that there are different notice requirements for different types of meetings and hearings. So all hearings are meetings, but not all meetings are hearings. That be, that's because when you're holding a hearing, you have a quorum of members of your public body gathered to discuss the business of the public body, say for a DRB. They're hearing applications, that's the business of the DRB for development review. And so that meets the definition of a meeting. Um, and because they're more specific, these are the notice requirements that are going to, oh, sorry, I think I went too far. These are the notice requirements that are going to control. So for a development review board hearing, uh, for conditional use review, variances, ZA appeals, there's uh, date, place, and purpose of the hearing has to be provided at least 15 days prior by publication in the newspaper, posting in three or more places, written notification to the applicant, and to all adjoining property owners. Okay. So in this example, the DRB wouldn't also have to notice a regular or special meeting unless it was conducting some non-hearing business. So that's what I mean. The more specific notice requirement is going to control. Now, in addition to publicly noticing your meetings, the open meeting law requires that you also have an agenda, um, which is great to see that you have. The word agenda isn't defined in the law, so again, we did just what we did with the word quorum. We looked to the dictionary for guidance, because the law does not say what an agenda is supposed to include. And the dictionary says that an agenda is a list or outline of things to be done, subjects to be discussed, or business to be transacted. It has to be posted at least 48 hours prior to a regular meeting, 24 hours prior to a special meeting, in or near the city office, and at least two other designated public places in the city, to a website, if one exists, uh, that it maintains or designates as the official website. And it has to be made available to anyone upon request. There's no agenda required for an emergency meeting, which makes sense, as you typically don't know you're going to have an emergency meeting until the last minute. Even if the law didn't require you to have an agenda, which again it does, having one is just a basic courtesy, not only to your fellow board members, but also to members of the public so that they can adequately prepare and decide whether or not they should take time out of their lives to attend the meeting. In addition to informing the public and your fellow board members what exactly it is you're going to be discussing and what business you're going to be transacting, agendas serve as a helpful roadmap by providing direction to your meetings. Now, the law not only explicitly requires that the public bodies compose and post an agenda, but it also limits how they may be altered. Any additions or deletions to an agenda have to be made as the first order of business of your meeting, which is why we would recommend having that as the first item on your agenda after you convene. Other adjustments, such as postponing an agenda item or rearranging the order, can be made at any time during the meeting. We would recommend using the same standard for adding business to your agenda that we would recommend for holding an emergency meeting, which is to ask yourself, is this something that is an unforeseen occurrence or condition that requires our immediate attention? If the answer is no and it can wait until the next regular special meeting, then add it to that meeting's agenda instead. And why this standard? 
is the law doesn't give you carte blanche authority to make any and every addition to the agenda as long as it was done as the first order of business. If this was the case, then a public body could just have a blank agenda and add whatever it wanted to at the beginning of the meeting and the law would have uh, no meaning at all. So remember the legislature's intent behind this law is to ensure that your meetings are open and transparent to the public. To that end, you have to give them some adequate notice to decide whether or not to attend your meetings and to express their opinions on matters that you consider. Before you go on, can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, so for uh, organizations that are public bodies that are intermunicipal or super municipal, uh, do we have to post agendas and warn them? So I'm thinking of like, uh, like uh, Super Law Public Safety Authority or uh, uh, other things that the city might be a member of. Um, you know, I, I think of. Um, CB Fiber. Easy Fiber, yes, yeah, CB Fiber, or even like the Regional Planning Commission. Regional Planning that Commission. Kind of, that kind of thing. Yep. Do all the municipal municipalities have to post the agendas for? They meet the definition of a municipality, yes. Um, I can't speak to each of those organizations because they're not actual members of the leagues. Um, so um, we only can advise our membership organization, so advise you to the Secretary of State's office. But if they meet the definition of a municipality, uh, then yes. Well, I think of too like the cemetery. I mean, the cemetery counts as its own municipality, so they would have to. Uh, the cemetery the is it a private organization no, or no, that's, that's the cemetery we can, commission? We can ask. Yes, them yes cemetery like, commission is a public body, and they would have to post an agenda. Mm -hmm. Yes, for their meetings. Yeah. Cool. Sorry, left right there. <laughs> Still in Jake's thunder. Uh, I'm curious as to your question. Oh, so I was just asking. So I was um, asking about. Um, the requirements for noticing meetings uh, in bodies that are uh, that the city might be a member of, or um, organizations that aren't strictly just um, cities, like for example the cemetery. So, like, how does it apply across for for other bodies that are that are not strictly cities or towns? Um, Central Mount Public Safety Authority, um, Regional Planning Commission. Well, that's right. It's so, a charter quasi municipality. Yeah, so they, yeah, they all do. You follow the open meeting. Central, Central Vermont. Okay. So solid waste districts. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So they do have to, but they don't have to necessarily post in all their member towns. Oh, correct. Right. Yes. They don't have to. Okay. I do not believe so, but I believe that some of those also have specific <coughs> notice provisions that would override the laws okay. of general applicability to all municipalities. Because they're more specific. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Okay, thank you. And again, that's general rule of thumb, more specific law controls over the more general. Okay? So of course, the law wouldn't, uh, as the name suggests, all meetings of a public body uh, are open to the public unless specifically exempted. That means, of course, that the public can't be excluded from your meetings unless the law explicitly, explicitly allows. And again, the law clearly emphasizes and values openness and accessibility. And as stated before, the Vermont Supreme Court has warned us that when any question exists, as to whether the law applies or not, or whether your meeting is open or not, they're gonna err on the side of transparency and access. Now, the Vermont Supreme Court has also said that the open meeting law protects not only the public's right to know, as I mentioned before, but also the right to be present, heard, and participate. And that brings us to public comment. To these ends, the law establishes a public right to comment at your meetings, but that right is not absolute. It is not without its limits. So first, the public is only entitled to a reasonable opportunity to express its opinion, and that reasonable opportunity can be limited in scope to matters considered by the public body during the meeting, and only so long as order is maintained. So why legally you could potentially limit public comment to only those items listed on your agenda, it's not, in my opinion, a very political viable one. Um, as it's not responsive to the needs and concerns of your community, um, as it otherwise could prevent them from raising issues of importance to them, which is why it's great that at the beginning of your meeting, you had an open comment provision. So as a best practice, we recommend that in addition to allowing public comment on each agenda item after it's discussed, but before it takes action, because that will help um, you make more informed decisions and also impress upon the public that their comments will actually be given consideration, that you also provide a more open-ended opportunity for public comment that falls under the heading of other business, either towards the beginning or end of your meeting. 
Now, the open meeting law also recognizes the importance of order by limiting public comment to the imposition of reasonable rules. This represents a compromise between the need for public comment and the need for you to do the work of your public body in the time allowed. So your meetings, after all, are meetings in the public. They're not meetings for the public, okay? What's the difference? Your meetings are what are called limited public forums in that they're spaces created for a very specific purpose, for you to discuss and do the work of your board. And while in this space, you don't have to allow members of the public to engage in every type of speech whenever they want. Now, that doesn't mean that you can discriminate against anyone based on what they have to say. Um, but it does mean that your board may impose restrictions in light of the purpose served by your meeting, so long, again, as they're reasonable, content neutral, mm -hmm. so you don't limit what someone is saying based on because of the message they're conveying, and they're applied equally to everyone. Okay. So rules of procedure in this picture no way represents the uh, fine citizens of Montpelier. <laughs> Rules of procedure can be used to help you strike a balance between encouraging public comments and allowing for the efficient operation of meetings. For example, you can enact rules to preserve civility and the quorum needed to conduct your business, such as requiring members of the public to raise their hands in order to be recognized by the chair before speaking. We had a municipality years ago uh, that was having a horrible time conducting its select board meetings, and one of the rules we recommended to them imposing was having people just raise their hands to be recognized. Otherwise, everyone was just shouting at the chair. Okay. <laughs> Directing all comments to the chair, you see this when you watch C-SPAN and you see um, ha the House of Representatives. Comments aren't directed to individual members. They're all addressed to the chair, okay? not to any individual member or of the public body or of the public. <clears throat> Refrain from personal attacks, uh, establishing a rule that if someone has already spoken, uh, that others have to first be given an opportunity before they can speak again. So all of those are included in our model rules of procedure, which I've included in your packet. Um, these rules are different when it comes to quasi-judicial he uh, hearings. These are instances when you're acting like a court. And as city council members, that will happen. The requirement that all meetings of a public body have to be open at all times does not extend to those, these instances. So unlike your other meetings, the public does not have the right to comment during the course of these proceedings. All the public has the right to do is attend and to listen, okay? So a hearing of the Development Review Board, of the Board of Civil Authority, if you were to hear a vicious dog hearing case, okay? These are all quasi-judicial hearings, and there is no right to public comment. Get into that a little more when we hit deliberations. And the last requirement of the open meeting law is that you make a record or minutes of your meetings. They have to be kept by the clerk or secretary of the public body, which doesn't have to, but could be the city clerk. They have to give a true indication of the meeting, what transpired, and include at a minimum all topics that are raised, uh, rise, all members of the public body present, uh, all other active participants, all motions, proposals, resolutions made in their result, and results of any votes with a record of individual votes if roll call is taken. Now, in most instances, what is minimally required listed here uh, will be sufficient to give a true indication of the business of the meeting. However, in other instances, information beyond what is minimally required may be needed to supplement the record uh, to show what transpired. It's always a good idea to provide more detail when there's a discussion on an important or controversial issue so that you, the public, and if need be, your attorney will have an accurate, historical, detailed record of what happened. Your minutes have to be made available for public inspection and copying by any person upon request after five calendar days from the date of the meeting. And in addition, they must be posted to a website, if one exists, that you maintain as the official website of the body uh, within that same time frame. So with the exception of draft minutes that have been replaced and updated, posted minutes have to stay on your website for at least one year from the date of the meeting from which they were taken. Again, you can leave them on longer if you'd like. Any questions there? We're gonna, the final portion here is gonna be exemptions, which I'm sure there's a lot of questions on, so any questions before we get into that? Yeah, I, I think before we get to exemptions, um, the big question in my mind is, or else what, right? Mm -hmm. Like, does this law have any teeth to it? I was at a school board meeting like a few weeks ago. Yeah. Somebody stood up for public comment, um, and they said, ah, should we let her speak? 
And they voted it down, right? Yeah. So what, what's the remedy? I don't think the Secretary of State has any enforcement powers, right? Are there so fines? Are there, <laughs> there, there is an enforcement provision, and it's the last <laughs> section of law. It's 1 BSA 314. And there, if, so, if there is a knowing and intentional violation of law, um, then you can be subject to a misdemeanor uh, and a $500 fine. Okay. Uh, there can also be a potential civil action brought against the city council. Um, and it could be that whatever actions you took at your meeting are determined not to be binding. Okay. Um, so there is criminal liability exposure for individual members. Um, and I have not heard of um, anyone having a uh, criminal action brought against them for this reason. Um, know that the standard here is knowingly the person knew what they were doing was wrong okay, and intentionally they did it anyways. So it's a relatively high bar uh, and prosecution would have to provide proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay? So that's for your kind of individual exposure and that applies to someone who violates the law someone who violates the law on behalf of someone else or at the behest of someone at the direction of the body or participates in a wrongful exclusion of someone from the meeting. Um, a complaint would have to be brought um, against the city for violating the open meeting law one year after the meeting at which the alleged violation took place. Um, and someone would have to uh, notify the board in writing of the specific violation and request a specific cure. There is then a time frame uh, for responding, uh, which we've included in your packet. I, I won't get into right now, uh, but it's basically that the board can either acknowledge the violation and take specific steps to cure it within, I believe it's a 14 day time frame um, after they address the allegation, um, or they can state that no violation actually occurred. Okay. At that point, what can happen is that anyone who is aggrieved by the act of the board or the non-action of the board uh, can bring an action in the Superior Court, or the atten Attorney General's office can do so as well. Okay? And then we get to a point where um, the city would be defending itself in a court action. So those are kind of the, the violations and enforcement mechanism. Okay. Yes, you uh, you said something about minutes, and I've been involved in another public body where this question came up and uh, and the issue is although there's this requirement to post the minutes within five days of the meeting technically they're not the minutes until they've been approved by the body well there is no requirement in the open meeting law that minutes of a public body actually be approved okay um, now it's certainly a best practice um, because Everyone can agree on what the record was, um, but there is no explicit requirement. What most boards do in order to meet that five-day requirement is that they'll, and it's a five-calendar day requirement, I think there was a move at the legislature to increase it and it didn't get anywhere last session, um, is to have mark your, if you do approve minutes, to mark uh, the ones you're putting up within that five-day time frame as draft or subject to approval. Okay. and then replacing them with the approved minutes, which may be a week or so after the fact. Okay, thanks. So, uh, we do have more questions and answers regarding minutes as well in our frequently asked questions. Okay. So our last session here is on exemptions. Um, so that was what the open meeting law requires of you, but not everything you do as a public body is covered by the open meeting law. There's going to be a times when a quorum of you can actually interact and the law has no application. And a lot of these provisions were added this last legislative session with Act 166. So, and a lot of them are very common sense solutions as well. So the passage of Act 166 at last session, they added, the legislature added to the list of activities that are excluded from the definition of a meeting. So if something doesn't qualify as a meeting, it doesn't fall under the auspices of the open meeting law. So these are the things that you can do that you don't have to comply with everything we just went over. And that includes, meeting no longer includes in its definitions and occasions where a quorum of you attend social gatherings, conventions, conferences, training programs, press conferences, media events, or otherwise gathers, so it's pretty broad, 
provided that the public body that's attending does not discuss specific business of the body that at the time you expect to be business at a later date. Okay. So what was this change in the law intended to cover? Well, for example, my organization conducts day-long seminars such as our select board institute. And oftentimes we'll have small select boards of a three-member select board. Two members come to the meeting. And they would ask us, are we supposed to warn this as a meeting? Should we warn our car ride here? Um, and we would tell them, well, you are discussing business of the public body, so conservatively, maybe you should. Um, and certainly on the, on the car ride, though, how is the public supposed to attend? They're not going to be able to, unless maybe it was victory and they got a school bus. Um, so, but we, we didn't know. So this was one of, the, one of the impetus for putting this law in place because we, the legislature recognized that you need to work within the, the context of this law and there needs to be practical realities that you can deal with. So now if we have a quorum members come to our training, they can discuss business of the body so long as it's not something that they're going to take action on in the future. So they could use uh, an example in order to, you know, help further a question along, for example. Okay. Um, yes. So I, <clears throat> I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What about attending a meeting of another public body, whether it's in your own city or a neighboring town select board meeting or city That's council? That's going meeting? to be our next one. Right. Yep. So, okay. so um, and again, the most cautious approach would be whenever there's a quorum of you, you don't discuss the business of the public body. Uh, but again, this allows you to so long as it's business that you're expected to take uh, later on. Okay. So we also have a meeting after last session no longer includes a gathering of a quorum of a public body at a duly worn meeting of another public body, which Bill just brought up provided that the attending public body doesn't take action on its business, okay? So this change came about, again, as a very common sense solution to an issue that kept coming up. I would get a call from a member, say, of a planning commission who wanted to attend a meeting of their select board, but they knew that uh, uh, so many other members of the planning commission were going to attend the same meeting that they decided they couldn't because they're going to trigger a quorum and they would have to warn it as a meeting. So. With this change in law, we avoid the complication of members of one public body having to stay away from meetings of another public body. Another, another follow-up question yes. on this. Occasionally, say the city council will ask a board to attend, a planning commission or somebody, just to get an update of what they're doing. And yeah. sometimes there might be a quorum of them here, although we're really maybe have only invited the chair or right. the, the staff person, but the others are there. there. And they are discussing you know, maybe how they're doing on the zoning rewrite or something yeah, like for that. Yeah, town plan amendments. Yeah. Right. Um, does the planning commission have to warn that they're going to be there? Nope, and that's what this law addresses. So, um, Even though they are talking about their own business. Even though they're talking about business, because as you notice, it says so long as they don't take action Conduct. on any board business. Okay. okay? Gotcha. So they can discuss board business. And this makes sense because otherwise you're having two public bodies notice the same hearing, provide an agenda for the same hearing, take minutes for the same hearing, it was it was okay. uh, just duplicitous, so it didn't it didn't it's make sense. Good yeah, so that was a great move from them. Okay, um, again, this is another refinement to the definition of what a meeting is. Okay, um, the open meeting law also allows a quorum of you to interact without triggering the requirements when you're scheduling a meeting, organizing an agenda, or distributing materials to discuss at a meeting. Okay. And because this falls outside the range of the open meeting law, it is not considered a meeting. You can do this by whatever means you'd like. You can do this as an email. Uh, you can do it as a text message. You can do it over the phone. You can do it in person over the telephone, however you'd like to. So, but you can't do any of these things and also discuss other business of the body, okay? Any documents that result, say you did send an email to schedule a meeting with your fellow members, those would be subject to disclosure, disclosure under Vermont's Public Records Act. Okay. So distributing materials here, so we have scheduling a meeting, organizing agenda, distributing information. Distributing does not mean discussion.
So think of this as being akin to the physical act of handing over documents to another person. It's acceptable to hand those documents over, but it's not acceptable to have a discussion about those documents as well. What is acceptable here is this one-way communication. Once there's a response to distribution, that communication turns into a discussion, and that discussion, as we spoke of earlier, if it involves a quorum of the members, could constitute a meeting. So, um, inadvertent, I'd say, violations of the open meeting law, especially those that arise through the use of electronic communication, can be um, reduced if email and text messages are principally employed to transmit information to a body's information um, concerning these purposes. Okay, you're transmitting information, you're scheduling a meeting, you're organizing an agenda. So in other words, the Vermont legislature has said that these are acceptable means of communicating as a quorum, okay, without triggering the requirements of the open meeting law. Um, again, email, similar communication should be used for distribution, passive receipt of information, not for the active exchange of ideas. Discussion of substantive matters should be reserved for public proceedings. Um, as we see here, the open meeting law has a very narrow allowance for communications between a quorum when those communications involve municipal business. Any communications not on that list should occur in the context of a meeting. Okay, just striking that off. So, um, can I uh, pull that last piece into a rule of thumb that says I could send uh, an email to everyone on city council, but if I receive an email, that's also to everyone on the rest of the city council. Excuse me, City Council. I can't reply all. I shouldn't. Should reply. not hit reply all. Should not in hit group, reply all. Right in group messages. Um, I've had that on occasion happen with communications sent to our office because people are interested in receiving uh, what the answer is, um, and someone will send the communication, include everyone else. You hit reply all, then others start responding to that, and all of a sudden you have a discussion about town business. Okay. So. Um, Again, common sense um, solutions from the legislature, uh, because before, how could you schedule a meeting? It's a chicken egg situation, right? It would have to be one person saying, we're having a meeting this day, and everyone would show up, or a quorum would show up. But you couldn't have a back and forth of, well, I can make it, I can't, can we do another day? Now you're violating the open meeting law. That's no longer a problem there. So the open meeting law. Our charter says our meetings are at the call of the mayor. So. I saw that, yes, and I have that note made, just in case it came up. Uh, the open meeting law also doesn't apply to site inspections for purposes, we've talked about this before a little, assessing damage or making tax assessments or abatements to clerical work or work assignments of staff, routine day-to-day -day administrative matters that don't require action of the public body. Some refer to this last exception as the work session exemption. However, there is no work session exemption to the open meeting law. Our understanding of this last exemption is that it would include certain municipal activities of municipal officers, such as listers and auditors, such as updating the lister cards, examining the treasurer's books. What wouldn't fit into this exemption are any actions taken by the board of listers or auditors that are required by law, such as lodging the grand list or making the decision of what goes into the annual report. Those are matters that are required by law to be taken. So if they're in here, you're required to, by law to, be, to take them, then they wouldn't fit into that routine day-to-day -day administrative matters exemption. Those actions have to be taken in the context of an open meeting. Then of course we come to everyone's favorite exemptions, deliberative and executive sessions. Uh, they also just happen to be most frequently confused. Um, we'll start with deliberative and end the night on executive session. Uh, the open meeting law says it doesn't extend to deliberations of any public body in connection with a quasi-judicial proceeding. Deliberations here means weighing, examining, discussing the reasons for or against a decision uh, or act. So does this mean that you're in deliberative session whenever you have to make a decision as a public body? No, it doesn't. As the law states, deliberative session only applies in conjunction with quasi-judicial proceedings. Those are proceedings, as we talked about earlier, uh, where you're acting like a court. Um, DRB land use hearings, Board of uh, Health hearings, uh, City Council hearings on laying out public highways. 
in each of these situations, it's the legal rights of specific individuals and that are at stake rather than the rights of the community at large. Once a hearing is closed, the public body is automatically in deliberative session by operation of law, and the session is exempt from all the requirements of the open meeting law. So this allows you as a public body to deliberate in private without public scrutiny and pressure, just like a jury does in order to come to a well-reasoned decision. And because the requirements of the open meeting law don't apply, deliberative sessions don't need to be noticed, they don't need an agenda, they don't need um, to allow for public comments or to be open to the public, and don't require the taking of minutes. Discussions can occur with as few or as many members of your board without triggering the quorum requirements of the open meeting law as well. Uh, and you can deliberate by whatever means or in whatever setting you want. You can also use email. The written decision will speak for the board, so you can send drafts back and forth to one another. Those drafts, those email communications, will not be considered, they're exempt from public disclosure under Vermont's Public Records Act. So in contrast to most every instance of executive session, you can also vote behind closed doors without the formality of having to, have a, a, to publicly announce your vote. And again, that's because the law explicitly provides that written decisions don't need to be adopted in the context of an open meeting if they're going to be a public record. Finally, your board doesn't have to use deliberative session if it doesn't want to. Um, it's more than free to deliberate in public. Now, in contrast to deliberative session, executive session is a closed meeting within a public meeting, if that makes any sense. The law permits public bodies to exclude the public from a portion of an open meeting in order to discuss certain topics specifically allowed for under the law. So as with deliberative session, there's nothing in the law that requires the <coughs> use of it, although it's certainly recommended in certain circumstances. It's another exception to the general rule that all meetings of a public body have to be open to the public at all times. Use of this exemption will be strictly construed by the courts, which means that any reasonable doubt will be resolved in favor of not using it. You can't just enter executive session. There are certain conditions that have to be met first. One, there has to be a motion that indicates the reason for entering executive session. That reason has to be one of the ones permitted in law. There has to be an affirmative vote of the majority of the members present. So this is a different standard than the rule of general applicability that you can only take action with the majority of the total of your membership. Here, it's a majority of the members present, which is going to be a quorum. Okay. Um, and the result of the vote has to be recorded in the meeting minutes. As stated, you can only enter for those reasons permitted by law. These are those reasons. There are others, but these are ones that pertain to municipalities. And these particular reasons only require one motion and a majority vote of those present. Okay, so we have negotiating, securing real estate purchases or lease options, the appointment or employment or evaluation of a public officer or employee. Important thing to note here is that <clears throat> if you make a decision to appoint, that has to be made in open session and you have to explain your reasons uh, for that decision. What I would recommend is that you give the reasons why you're appointing someone and not why you're not appointing someone else. Okay. Disciplinary or dismissal action against a public officer or employee, but that person has a right to a hearing. You have a clear and eminent peril to the public safety, uh, discussion of records that are exempt from the public records law, and emergency response measures for the municipality. Um, a question on the last one about uh, you're required to, to state your reasons for appointing someone. Yes. You're required every time you appoint someone to explicitly state why? If you're going into executive session for that purpose and then coming out, then you have to make uh, your decision in open session and explain the reasons why. Now, you could decide just to appoint an open session in which case you don't have to give reasons for it. Yeah. Okay. But this is a condition of utilizing executive session. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm imagining... Playing that out. Yeah, only because uh, often it feels like we appoint people because there's a vacancy and it needs to be filled. And there I don't go. know... <laughs> that's, that's a reason. Yeah. Yep. Okay. But we might not go into executive session for that. Yeah. Sometimes we don't do that if there's one person for one slot. Right. 
Okay. It doesn't have to be a lot said. I mean, we usually no. say something about why, just no. don't you say something, right? Exactly. Some reason. So the motion for entering executive session for these reasons, again, is one motion, has to indicate the nature of the business of the executive session and should, but doesn't have to, it's not required to, cite the specific statutory citation for doing so. So the proposed motion uh, should include as much detail as possible without undermining why you're actually going to executive session in the first place. So for example, if you're going into executive session to conduct an employee performance appraisal, you could say something to the effect of, because it's time for the zoning administrator's annual performance evaluation, I move that we enter executive session to discuss the evaluation of a public officer employee pursuant to Title I, Section 313A3 of Vermont statutes. Simple enough. For the following reasons for entering, the following reasons for entering executive session require a finding by you that utilizing it, um, that, sorry, utilizing them that premature general public knowledge would place the public body of person involved at a substantial disadvantage. So you have to find for going into executive session for this reason that premature general public knowledge would place the public body of person involved at a substantial disadvantage. This was a legislative change a couple of years ago, but it was actually required of you in 1993 in the Trombley case by the Vermont Supreme Court, and the legislature just recently explicitly put it in the law so that you know to follow it. So to enter executive session for any of these reasons, and you can see it's for contracts, labor relation agreements, arbitration, mediation, grievances, probable civil litigation, of which the public body is a party, confidential attorney-client communications. To enter into executive session for any of these reasons, we recommend that you make two separate motions because of that requirement. Um, and the reason is it's not enough to just want to go in executive session for these reasons, discuss these issues. You have to demonstrate a need to do so. Um, the cleanest way of demonstrating compliance with this requirement is to make two separate motions. The first one would be to find that premature public discussion of the subject would cause the city or some other person to suffer a substantial disadvantage. So for example, in the case of a contract under negotiation, the motion may be, I move to find that premature general public knowledge of the pending contract with this company will clearly place the city at a substantial disadvantage by, say for example, disclosing our negotiation strategy. Okay? In this hypothetical, the substantial disadvantage would be the risk the city has of losing its competitive edge in negotiations by talking about specific contract terms in open session. If the company here were to hear that the public body talked about the maximum price it can afford to pay, then the company is not going to take anything less than that amount. Okay. Now, the second motion follows from the first and should cite the specific legal authority again for entering executive session. So for example, I move that we enter executive session to discuss the city's contract under provision Title I, Section 313. It's important that the minutes of your meeting reflect that there was a careful analysis of the need to enter into executive session before the, before the first motion is made to demonstrate compliance. Okay. Now, I just want to give you some final thoughts on the use of executive session. It's not explicitly required by law to be listed on a meeting agenda. Some think it is poor form to put executive session on agenda because doing so presupposes that one's going to be held. Others say that the purpose of an agenda is to provide notice of what is likely to transpire and putting it on the agenda serves that purpose. We follow the second camp. We think it's a best practice to list an executive session on your agenda, but only when you know in advance that you're likely to raise the motion. We do not recommend always putting on possible executive session as a placeholder in case something comes up. Okay. Listing it as a possible executive session signifies nothing more than you're going to take up the possibility of executive session. It also serves as a reminder to you that you're going to have to vote before you go into executive session. And also it provides a courtesy to any anticipated attendees informing them that there may be a portion of the meeting that's going to be closed off to them for a period of time. Um, because it's a closed portion of an open meeting, motion again has to take place in the context of duly worn meeting. You therefore always have to have uh, be in an open meeting first before you enter executive session. 
Um, it is not open to the public. The only people that have a right to attend are members of the public body, regardless of how they voted, and anyone else that, in their discretion, they decide can enter. So the law says attendance in executive session is limited to members of the public body, and in their discretion, it's staff, clerical assistants, and legal counsel, and persons who are subjects of discussion or whose information is needed. Finally, while you're in executive session, no other uh, matter can be discussed, no formal or binding action can be taken except securing real estate uh, options. So to take action, you have to agree to come out of executive session and take action during the course of a meeting. Minutes don't have to be taken, but if they are taken, they're not subject to disclosure under Vermont Public Records Act. Okay. Um, some people say that you can't take <coughs> action in public um, in executive session other again than for the um, the real estate securing real estate options but you're going to have to come to some uh, agreement to agree to come out of executive session or else you're going to be in this twilight zone executive session that you can never get out of so a question yes you mentioned the motion yes and yes, you, you, might you mentioned you, you can have other people there yeah, besides the Excuse, thank you. Okay. You mentioned the motion, but and on the second slide, you mentioned the people who should be in, could be in the executive session. We tend to ask people in our motion. We invite the city manager to join the, the council. Is that necessary? No, that's fine to ask them because again, it's in your discretion. So it's uh, it's ultimately up to the city council who enters executive session. But you say you worded in the actual motion. Usually, I mean, yeah, we usually just say we move to go into executive session for X and include the manager, fine. the assistant manager, sure. the finance director. So long as, and that's a thing about voting, so long as everyone knows what they're voting for and there's a record of it, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. It could be if someone has an issue with that, how it's stated, they could stay. Um, I, I, I potentially want to go into executive session, but I don't know that we should have the city manager invited. Um, can we break out those motions? But it, it is best to have it in the motion. I guess that's my question. Um, that the, the board agree, yes, yes. because okay. otherwise you could say uh, it's just quiet acquiescence. Uh, but there should be some consensus of who's going to attend executive session with the public body. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I just want to start that I feel like we, a while ago we had an assumption that the city manager was invited. And so we hadn't been saying it explicitly, but it might be better to do that. And you can follow, you can follow, you know, okay. customary practice. Okay. Again, it's so long as everyone on the council knows that they're going to executive session, what it's for, and who's being invited. Okay. And my last slide here is just um, a link to our resource. Um, again, everything, including your packet, is available on our website. It includes links to the FAQs, the Quick Guide, and Model Rules of Procedure. Um, and, yeah, and if you have any questions, please feel free to call us at the number provided or email us um, Monday through Friday. And thank you for hanging in there. Thanks. Thanks. This has been great. Great material. Thanks. And he says he doesn't get enough calls from Montpelier Mayor, so we should all call him more. Okay. Good to know. We're, we're right across the street, too, so feel free to do a pop-in. Right. Always happy to speak with you. All right, any further questions? Okay, well, thank you so much for being here. And, uh, thank you. <coughs> it's been very helpful. Okay. Uh, how are you all feeling? Do you want a break? Do you want to? I think this break? might be a good time. Okay, okay. let's take uh, just about a five-minute break. Take five and come back. In. Yep. Sounds good. Okay, so uh, we are coming back from our break. Uh, the next item is uh, committee assignments. So every year we um, have council reps who are appointed to um, to various uh, committees and boards uh, throughout the city. So um, how shall we take this? Uh, we have uh, attached the agenda last year's uh, appointment set. Um, so I think it's probably it probably just makes sense to take this all um, linearly and then um, perhaps have just one motion at the end. Um, you know, with all the aforementioned appointments. Um, so, Americans with Disabilities uh, Committee. There's actually an error in there. I'm a, I actually am the council representative to that committee, and I'm uh, 
willing to stay on it. Okay, great, thank you. And anybody that's uh, interested in that one? Okay, we move on. Uh, Building Code Appeals Committee. Glenn, you were on it before? Yeah, the name. It used to be a different uh, name of that committee, I believe, but I recognize it. <laughs> okay. And I'm told that we actually do need someone because there may be an appeal coming up. Do you mean, uh, well, it looks like there was, uh, Glenn was on it, and then there's a vacant. It was Rosie. It was Rosie. So we, uh, we do, in fact, need two people from the right. council on that. Okay, so, and Glenn, are you willing to be one of those two people again? Yep. Okay. I will do it. Oh, thanks, Ashley. Anybody else interested? Oh, okay. Capital Complex Committee, uh, no council rep, but we have had Paul Carnahan. Is this an appointment that we would make tonight? Not, or <coughs> Not necessarily. Oh, because we'd probably need to warn that. And I mean, I don't know that that's been. I think we looked into that last year, and there was a certain term. But we'll check it out. OK, so we'll assume, assume that we're not making that appointment tonight. Right. OK. Uh, Capital Improvement Planning Committee. So the CIP, so last year I was on this, uh, with Donna and Glenn. Donna and Glenn, what do you think? Or if anybody else wants it, yeah. Okay. I certainly like to stay on it. Glenn? Likewise, I'd like to stay on it if I can. Um, so in the past, we've also had um, new council members um, on this committee. So Lauren, if you are interested, um, that's fine. I'm uh, also interested in it, but I would step down if you wanted to do it. There's a couple others I'm interested in, so I'll let Okay, you. I'm happy to continue on that. Um, that can be anybody else interested in that one. Okay, uh, Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. So uh, this one, so Donna, you were on that last year. Right, uh, the appointment, the authority asked for two year terms, so mine would expire when my council seat, unless you okay. think otherwise, but that's how they did it. But two years <coughs> resigned. Donna, you might. <laughs> uh, and so Thomas resigned. Now yep. he was not a city councilor. No, but he was our rep. But he was our rep. He so was appointed rep from the council. And his term expired this year. So one hypothesis, and I guess I'm just looking for a bit of advice here. Um, one hypothesis is that uh, another council person should take that spot. Another hypothesis is that it could just be a um, an, another appointment of the council. Either way. Um, so I guess one question is: Is there any uh, council member interested? I would. I would, I guess I, I'm happy to do it, but I'm a little unclear sort of where the CVPSA is at. And we don't have to get into that right now. I'm happy to, to be the second council rep, but. I'm available anytime you want to talk about it. I love it. <laughs> I have been. So, I'll find you. So do you, would you like that appointment then? I will take it. Okay. 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 Okay, uh, Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. Uh, there's no council rep. Um, again, this is one of these that should we be making this appointment tonight? Donna isn't on that. Central I'm Vermont. on the TAC. The actual re Regional Planning Commission has asked for somebody from our Planning Commission, and that's why Kurt is there. But Kirby. it doesn't mean Kirby. there can't be a city council member also. Right, we get one rep. Yeah, you only get one rep that has a vote. Okay. So that's why it says N.A. Yeah. N.A. Yeah. for us, right. So we've appointed Kirby from yeah. the Planning Commission. That's what I was trying to explain. Right. <coughs> okay. From the Planning Commission. And uh, so is that an appointment that we need to make tonight? No. No, we usually don't do one okay. because we have one from the Planning okay. Commission. So. All right, great. So, um, and I'm on their TAC, their Transportation Advisory Group. And, um, and I really, really enjoy that. Okay. Uh, great. So we're going to move on from the Regional Planning Commission. For the TAC, Donna, you're interested. Was, was anyone else interested in the, the TAC? No? Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Um, Central Vermont Solid Waste District or Management. Um, I would love to open this up to someone else. No I'm, one took I'm it last year. Okay. Anyone else interested in it? And we, have the, we have the appointment. We also have an appointment. This is the alternate, right? Is yes, yes, I would say alternate. Although it doesn't have to be. Okay. So that was Lauren? That was Lauren, yep. All right, uh, the uh, Community Justice Center's Citizen Advisory Board. 
so that had been me, but the meeting times have not really lined up with my work schedule because they're usually between 5 and 5.30, and I have not been able to get out of work consistently. I'll do it. Okay. Thank you, Connor. Anyone else interested? Okay. All right. City Hall Art Committee. I know we weren't <laughs> terribly active last year. Well, I, yes. it's a new, oh, it's a new yes. year. Yes. I would like to change the art out. So, In the hallway, there's a lot City Hall could do for yeah. itself. Yes. I, I, I was waiting for the call last year. <laughs> <laughs> but we uh, are waiting for you. We should make him chair. I, I agree. I think that's a great idea. There you go, Glenn. There you go. Okay, so. Happy to serve. Great. <laughs> Anybody else interested? He'll make our meetings Thursday morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Donna, are you still interested in that? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. I'm happy to stick around on that committee, too. But, Glenn, you're in charge. Okay. Glenn and Jamie, you're in charge. There you go, Glenn and Jamie. <laughs> yeah, I, I accept that. Okay. Uh, Energy Advisory Committee. I have been that person. I'm happy to do it again, unless somebody else is interested. No, that's all you. Unless you want, Lauren? Huh? We can have... Can we have two people? <laughs> can we have two people? We can have two. It's committee, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think there's any reason not to. So let's have us both sure. be there. Great. Super. Awesome. All right, Harry Sheridan Scholarship. I'm at the high school. I'm happy to continue to do that unless anybody else is interested. Tell me what it is just because I don't know. Uh, it was a scholarship s set up for students of Montpelier. Um, that uh, is like the as part of the will, um, the executor, executor, trustee, main trustee. I think that's the that's the right word um, of that scholarship is uh, someone from the city council. Does that help? Okay. <coughs> and so it's you, in it. You help decide who gets it. Right? Yes. So, so yes. So. Probably the person at the high school would be the best person. Yeah. <laughs> it does help to n have know some of the humans beforehand. Uh, okay, so uh, housing task force. Yeah. Yeah, anybody <laughs> else? No? Okay, great. Uh, and the trust fund? I think yes, but I, as I recall, we also adopted a new uh, rules of uh, procedure, so there may be some some changes in uh, in the makeup, but for, for now, why don't we keep me on it? Okay. Anybody else interested in that one? Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, all right. Investment committee. Um, I am actually uh, willing to step down from that. Um, it's been very interesting, very educational. Um, yeah. Anyone else interested? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> awesome. All right. <coughs> okay. Uh, Montpelier Alive board has been Connor. Happy to stay. Okay. Anybody else? It's okay. Okay. All right. The Montpelier Foundation. I wonder if we should take. Oh, uh, that's. Uh, we had some changes in their bylaws this year. Right. So it's <coughs> the mayor or their designee. Still? Even so? I don't, yeah. know, I don't it recall. It was the ex officio. We had a little discussion about ex officio. Uh, ex officio. Uh, all right, so. Did they file Oh, that's that right, though? because. What's that? Did they file yet? I don't know. So I would, I would just point out, though, that nothing has changed if they haven't right. filed that. Yeah, fair. Uh, nonetheless, we still get uh, an appointment. Right. Um, so anyone interested in that? Okay. Oh, thank you, Glenn. Awesome. Anybody else interested? Yes. Okay. Well, so if there are two people interested. Um, if we only get one, I would defer. Uh, Can't you I, make the meetings? I, I suspect meetings. we only get one. Yeah. When are, when are the meetings? I don't know. Okay. I don't know either. Well, if, if I'm happy to do it, and if the meetings are at such a time that I just, there's no feasible way to make it work, then I'll take it. I'll find you. you, you good. Let us know. Yes. Okay. And then we can revisit it. <coughs> okay. 
uh, parking task force. This, I don't even know if it well, still this one it was sort of done. It was a task force. Or just the we it, met and now. well, it did with the demand management strategy. Yep. But it was also interested in the replacement parking for all the construction. And mm -hmm. I know for myself, I seem to phone off the email on that, and I have well, no it hasn't, idea it hasn't where that is. Happened. There's mm -hmm. no. You haven't fallen off the email because okay. I, I think that was when Ken was sort of organizing, right? Right. Yeah, we haven't met for ages. Well, and we were going to, there was well, going to be. We've been working on some of the ideas, mm -hmm. but. Right, like there was going to be a strategy right. for demand management. And I remember Kevin was like out for a while. and. Yeah, there were all kinds of reasons, but also we did hear that GMT was looking at the demand mm -hmm. management, on, on demand management, and we were excited about that. And uh, we have found a you know, one of the issues was finding a place for Capital Plaza, and we found that. Um, but we're still, you know, we've, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get someone who said they would lease parking and now won't respond to me, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, so um, one question is, like, do we still need this task force? I don't, I, not as a formal group, I don't think. Okay. Well, and we can always reform okay. it later yeah, as demand. Well, I'm just actually. really concerned that we haven't taken we're not further along with facing what we need during the construction season. If everything we're planning happens, we're going to need some really coordinated parking options. It depends when the construction options. is, too, to yep. some extent. That's fair. I mean, I wonder if there's also some reason to follow up just on the demand management side. I already um, reached out, actually, this week to the head of GMT, asked him for an update. I haven't mm -hmm. heard back. Okay. This really seems like something that can be an administrative function rather than a public policy function like mm -hmm. committee. It just really needs to happen. That and, I mean, the micro transit is, hap is meeting and fits into this kind of demand management and mm -hmm. demand transit, but it's not going to happen in time for any construction in 2019 mm -hmm. or probably 2020. I guess my gut. And we hear different things about that. Okay. So, so well, so my I, I'm inclined to agree with you, actually, Donna. But we hear from some other sources that it could be this summer, and so I've actually, like I said, I just reached out yesterday to Mark Souza from GMT and said, "What's the story?" I keep hearing these different, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't we keep it as a group, and uh, so just so that you know, if or when there's mm -hmm. a, you need, a need for to discuss, there's you know people who are involved. Um, I'm happy to stay on it. Um, Me too. You, okay. Yes. I'd anyone interested. else interested in um, that that committee? Okay. So, should it be needed, we're around. <coughs> what you know to review any of that? Uh, okay. Social and economic justice advisory committee. So I had been, um, and I think the meetings are Tuesday, some, somewhere on Mondays, which I cannot do, and some are on Tuesdays. So I haven't been able to make all of the meetings. I am interested if cool. we'll change or if two of us. Yeah. I'm, I can show up when I can show up, but I don't. I don't feel as though like it's reasonable for me to represent that anyone could depend on me religiously making it to every meeting mm -hmm. when when that's sort of when the time that works for everybody else is. I don't think there's any uh, harm in you know if it's Lauren and you still want to show up when mm -hmm. you can. It's a public meeting. Yeah. Yeah, I've showed up to a few. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll assume it's Lauren uh, on point there. Uh, Transportation Infrastructure Committee. I'm still interested in it. I can invite other people to come and join us. Others. Yeah, I'm kind of interested in that too. I have Glenn, you're. Yeah, and me. Uh, I, well, it's, it is our committee. We can have more people. No, this, oh, our own transportation. This is our own transportation yeah. committee. Right, so we could have three people. When does the committee meet? It meets on the first Tuesday of the month, except for town meeting day. <laughs> and there's. A couple other holidays hit on the first Tuesday, but first um, Tuesday in the month at six p.m. six oh. to seven thirty. Oh, okay. So, yeah, because the ADA committee work meets during the work day on the first Tuesday, but that's fine. Okay. Okay. So I heard three people for that one. A. Eh? Okay. Did, you, did we get that? So it's Donna Glennon, Jack. Great. 
Uh, all right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the TW Wood Board. I, I think, according to their uh, bylaws, I you know I'm on the committee, but I generally can't go. I've been going. It's good. Uh, I'm happy to continue. Okay. Great. Anyone else? Okay. Super. Thank you. Um, water rate study committee. Is this still a thing? Not really. I don't think. Connor, how's it going? <laughs> no, it's has not it a thing. Good? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's, I think. Let's just take it off. Let's just take that off the list. If yeah. we need a new it's one, we'll form needed. a new one as needed. Okay. Okay, so um, is there a motion to approve the appointments as discussed? So moved. Second. Further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. I yes. do have one thing. Um, one of the things that I think, at least in my experience, some of the newer committees have struggled with is sort of a, a like a purpose you know when when there's not already an established directive and I'm wondering if we could just maybe try to pencil in for the next calendar year sort of when committees or various groups that that council members are part of could provide like either just a, a written update to the council or just just in some way so people know in advance like hey this is the month when the council wants to hear from you like what your committee's been doing or, you know, just just kind of doing that like check in mm. with with some degree of like expectation like this is the month or this is the meeting that we'll be presenting at and you know here's here's a written summary because you know we only do something every two years and you know this is maybe an off year or whatever it might be just so that so that the council is kept abreast of what's ongoing because not all of us I mean, there, it's not conceivable that we all know exactly what's happening or what's going to be asked of us later, and, and that might help to keep the public engaged. This actually reminds me of something we talked about. Yes. Um, I asked that, were you there during our evaluation, that it's really important that we have regular check-in with our committee yeah. reps? So, so one possibility is that, uh, I, mean, I mean, we've all... I'm sorry, did we just vote? We did just vote. We did. Yes. We did yes. just vote, okay. Um, we've all just been appointed to these committees. One uh, possibility is that uh, either during our, uh, either as a separate agenda item or during our um, council reports that, you know, that we're hearing from you during that time as to what's happening on that committee. You know, what's like the two, uh, you know, two sentence update as to what you, what that committee has been working on. and. Um, and what whatnot. Um, yeah. Jonah, do you have some more? I, I'm yeah. probably looking sour. I it's just okay. found that I do that. I use my council report. <laughs> I don't think it's very effective because everybody wants to leave. <laughs> it's the last thing you want to hear or the last thing you seem to absorb. So it, it's a beginning, but I just don't think it's really effective way. And particularly as Ashley was talking about, it's a give and take. It's sharing, but it's also hearing where the council is on certain things that our committee is talking about. Well, I think you can do both. It, you know, I, way back when we established having council reps and all these committees, part of the goal was that the council members could keep the other council folks updated. So probably we could do that at the council reports, but also schedule times when the committee comes in, we have a more focused conversation. So you know, yeah. but in the meantime, as, as things are happening, you say, well, you know, we're talking about this, especially if it's something that might be coming up in the future. It's like, well, you know, just so you know, this committee might have something in a couple months, so just you know it's coming. And that is a chance for the council to say, well, wait a minute, what's that about? Maybe we want that on an agenda soon. So I'm feeling the, the both there, yeah. right? Like, let's try to have uh, updates during our council reports from the committees, but also um, let's have some intentional time mm -hmm. uh, to have updates uh, from committees. I think it'd be, be, good. Good. be good. Okay. Super. Um, further thoughts on that? Okay, so we have uh, an appointment to make. This is uh, to the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District. Um, I think we have one applicant. Ellen. Ellen and one one seat though you were the alternate but it this is a little confusing to me because you were we also just appointed you the council as the alternate as the al as okay the alternate. as the alternate okay right. okay 
I mean, Ellen's very good if Ashley doesn't mind being the alternate. The thing is you get oh. all the mailings you can get on the list for the Solid Waste District. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lauren. Lauren, oh, sorry, Lauren. Like, you get all the mailings right. Lauren, and, yeah. and then and you, you probably get about two or three times you can actually go and have a vote, but you can always go. Mm -hmm. Some of the discussions are really very meaningful to be there and be present. Uh, so I would make the motion that we appoint Alan Cheney as the rep on the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management and Lauren as the alternate. A second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor? Uh, oh, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Ellen works with me, and I can just tell you that Ellen is very enthusiastic about this stuff. She's very committed to this uh, to this area, and I think she's uh, she's really good for this. Awesome. Great. Further discussion. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Super. Thank you, Lauren, and we'll pass on our thanks to Ellen. So, and when you let the Solid Waste District know, make sure they get contact information for Lauren, if you would. Is your city website up? I mean, do you have your city email? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, we have one more appointment to make. Um, Kate McCann was the only applicant for uh, two vacant seats on the uh, Transportation Infrastructure Committee. I don't, yeah, go ahead. I'd like to move to appoint Kate McCann to the Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure Committee. Second. Uh, further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So there, there was one vacant seat. You are appointed three council members where we had had one, so you could just maybe leave the other one There's vacant. actually three vacancies. Oh, perfect. So yeah. you just fill two of, two of the three. Okay. Good. So we don't actually need to... Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for that clarification. That was not clear. Okay. I don't think they all got reported. Okay. Because we were, I, that was the organization I was asking Garrett about. Okay. Mm -hmm. When it, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Perfect. Great. Uh, it's, we have no other regular uh, business. So, council reports. So, just so you know, Lauren's time for uh, counselors to share. Um, Pretty much anything, really. <laughs> um, so, but we'll start with Don and we'll go around this way. Okay, so the Infrastructure Committee <coughs> has just approved funding of $5,200 towards a covered bike rack that will go out here where the current bike rack is in front of City Hall, or the side of the front of City Hall. And the Complete Streets Committee really has been the one taking the initiative and work with Northfield University to get a design. At one point, Norwich is going to do the labor, but they're not now. So we may have to make some collaborative to make this bike rack work at $5,200. But it's in the works, and they'll probably you'll be hearing more about it. Uh, likewise, the Parks has a new member like us who got elected. I'm not remembering her name right now. Is it? It's Cassie. Um, but she's from North Wilderness Adventures and has a lot of experience. So will really enhance. Uh, our Parks Commission a lot, very, very good. So uh, lots of good things happening there. And within the Regional Planning Commission TAC, uh, Montpelier Bridges are the top three of the four. And that's due to Tom McCarthy really working with me and working with the Regional Planning Commission of give and take, because it's all the regional bridges competing for this very small amount of money. So if Montpelier does any lobbying, that they should increase this small fund of money for bridges and roads for towns, it's really important. It hasn't changed for m dozens of years. It's and among it's the highest priorities on the lead I mean, if you can imagine that the Regional Planning Commission is dealing with $175,000. That's it. That's and it. it and all 23 towns are fighting over this, and they do it very well, very politely, but it's just not enough funds. So, so. That's right. Great. Thank you. All right, thank you for your confidence in appointing me to the Investment Committee. Um, <laughs> as you remember, back in January, we uh, made a motion to engage ESG experts to look at divesting um, from different uh, groups that would violate labor rights, human rights, or good citizenship, uh, or also run afoul of environmental justice. So I do have a group of experts who would be willing to come in and talk to us. So. 
I would certainly bring Todd in the mix, but if anybody else wants to join us, that would be great. We'll set that up in the next couple of weeks here. Um, also, some things coming down the pike. Um, I have a socially responsible um, contractor ordinance I, I've started looking at a bit. Uh, so we'd bring that up at a future meeting uh, just to run some of the ideas by you. Um, and the scooter survey is back, working with uh, Sue now to develop a robust public input process uh, going forward uh, to talk about the future of scooters. Uh, as you may know, Burlington um, <coughs> is looking at this. They had a whole process that I think we can borrow from a bit. Uh, but it looks like they're going with a company called Gotcha, which also does electric bikes um, and I think golf carts. So just a few things in the pipeline there. Thanks very much. Um, going to report from my committee, uh, the Wood uh, Board, and Donna, I want to say uh, it's true that sometimes I want to leave at the end when we're in council reports, but sometimes I want to leave at the beginning, so uh, I, I think there's no terrible difference. Um, yeah. um, but no, uh, the, the... Can you use it? Where's the remote? Oh, it's oh. up here. Oh. Thank you. Good Sorry. call. Thank you, Sorry. Steve. Um, so reporting from the T.W. Wood Gallery, um, they are in the middle of a search for a new executive director. After a couple of years, Ginny Callen uh, is stepping down. Uh, and uh, I would, uh, well, I'm really looking forward to that process. Uh, applications are due on Friday, I think. That's the 15th. And it's, uh, it's an exciting time for the Wood. Um, they're also working on an elevator for the building, the, the Center for Arts and Learning. Uh, it's a, a, I think it's a four-story building, uh, and the elevator is going to have five stops, and it's not going to stop on the top floor because it's <laughs> two buildings tacked together. So it's surprisingly expensive for, for a short elevator, but they are working hard, and it should be great. Um, and there are a couple of great shows up at the Wood right now. Uh, including a uh, show of paintings by local uh, Ray Brown. And not this Thursday, but the following Thursday, the, there will be a film premiere of a movie by Nat Winthrop on Ray Brown's painting in his life uh, at The Wood. You should all go. I think it's 5 to 7 Thursday next week at The Wood. Um, I was really pleased to see in the, the uh, report this past Friday that there's a really cool uh, snowplow tracker uh, online that, that uh, DPW is setting up. And uh, I'm not sure if it's officially fully launched yet, but you can find it. Um, and I think that's great. Uh, and uh, I will be at Baguito's as usual tomorrow morning, 8.30 to 9.30, if anyone has anything they would like to talk about. Thank you. Um, I would just like to thank all of um, District 3 who came out to vote on town meeting day. Um, and I, I am very aware of, of some of the significant concerns that people have raised um, about the energy efficiency um, ballot item. And I... Um, you know, I've had lots of conversations with folks about this and sort of did, you know, did my best to, to explain sort of what, what I envision as, as being the path forward um, from that. And so um, I just want to put out there that I'd like to start those conversations uh, as soon as possible, just, just in terms of like even what the council was thinking um, with this, because I think um, with, with community collaboration and input and bringing stakeholders together a lot earlier on in the process but you know I, I'd even say we should probably do that before um, it, it even comes up to go to the legislature next session um, I think that those conversations are really really worthwhile I have a lot of friends who've been looking for places to live here and there's just there's very few options in terms of rentals and so um, I just I want everybody to know that that you know the the margin was small but uh, I think that with, with the council support and with community support and just really bringing everybody together up front to, to sort of talk about concerns and, and figure out you know, a, a path forward together, um, we could do some really meaningful work. Cool. It's not on the, it wasn't on the agenda tonight, but I will uh, 
can report on what's going on with the ADA committee. Um, we, uh, the committee has go been going through a process of evaluating all of the uh, municipal properties in the city and uh, retained uh, a consultant to review all the properties in the city and come up with a plan for uh, what needs to be done to bring everything into compliance with the ADA and it's everything from City Hall to uh, the Public Works Garage to uh, to Hubbard Park and the uh, and the swimming pool, liter literally everything. And so we've got a table we're working on, uh, setting priorities for all the uh, all the upgrades. Some of the upgrades are uh, are cheap to free, and some of them are uh, very expensive. So it's we're d we're developing a plan within the next. Uh, Probably in April or May, we'll be coming to the to the council to uh, to make a presentation. With the plan being that uh, we would have a plan in place by uh, June first, I believe. And so there's there's a lot of good work that's been done already, and uh, keep your eye open for it. Well, I'm really excited to be here and appreciative of the voters in District 1 and um, really have a lot to learn. So please, anyone, contact me anytime. My info's up on the City Council website and um, would love to just learn about issues that you all care about and that we might be working on. So look forward to um, just kind of rolling up my sleeves and getting to work and you know I bring a background on environmental issues and really interested in racial justice economic inequality issues also bringing the perspective of having young children as you saw at the beginning my loud and <laughs> <laughs> rambunctious children so you know how we're making the city a, a great place for um, young families so really look forward to working with you all and excited to be here great uh, so I would just uh, add uh, congratulations again on your, uh, your re-election and, and welcome, Lauren. I know I said that at the beginning, but it's uh, worth repeating. Um, so glad to have you all um, here again or for the first time. Uh, so just to update a little bit about um, the energy committee that uh, I've been on. Uh, we're working on lots of different things, so I won't get into a lot of it. Um, I mean, it's everything from like, uh, projects that uh, are uh, potentials for the Green Revolving Loan Fund uh, to continuing to be in touch with people from the um, uh, Water Resource Recovery Facility project to help make sure um, you know that that's uh, that's going smoothly um, or staying uh, in you know updated on on that. Um, there's a lot of talk about biodiesel right now um, as a potential for fleet vehicles. Um, as well as in um, heating for heating buildings. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of logistic questions around both of those um, those things, but uh, those are things that uh, you know we think may be able to be worked out. So we're excited about uh, uh, biodiesel as a potential. Um, so I'm, more about that hopefully soon. Um, we're super excited that uh, we've got a facilities uh, slash energy person uh, coming on board uh, during this uh, next uh, fiscal year, um, or I guess that's, yeah, right now it is the next fiscal year. Um, and I guess that's, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Lots of work going on around um, weatherization, uh, and like uh, window dressers to like help make those more energy efficient. Um, anyway, so there's there's lots of uh, uh, great things happening, um, and I also want to uh, quickly address uh, uh, the Article 14 again, uh, the energy efficiency um, article that was uh, on the on the ballot. Uh, so I also want to thank everybody who came out to vote on that. And I was actually very grateful for the dialogue that happened uh, around that as well. And and I uh, I'm actually. Uh, really excited to start having these public uh, conversations about where we go from here. And so I agree uh, uh, with Councillor Hill as to getting started with those dialogues, with those count those uh, conversations. Um, and the fellow who is here, um, uh, Richard Fazy from a group called the Energy Futures Group, uh, 
uh, may be interested in helping to facilitate some public uh, meetings uh, around that. So just like we um, have a, a partnership with the uh, uh, Vermont River Conservancy to conduct public meetings um, around visioning for the um, the river, a specific part of uh, the part of the river. Um, this may be a, a useful partnership in helping to just start um, hosting meetings and framing meetings and, and bringing people together um, uh, with stakeholders. And they're also a, a group that uh, has some expertise in um, energy efficiency uh, policy. So that's um, this is one possibility. Um, and uh, so anyway, regardless, I'm looking forward to having some uh, specific uh, public forums about just that. So separate from a council meeting, separate from, um, you know, not, not relegating it to the energy committee, uh, but having a, some, some evenings that are just dedicated to talking about that. And, um, and we'll frame that up, take that feedback, and, um, and then uh, hopefully come up with some, some ideas and come back to the public and vet it again and, um, you know, just go through some iterative process there, um, you know, knowing that we have uh, values of, of both energy efficiency and keeping Montpelier affordable. So, um, you know, we want to see how we can be addressing both of those things. Um, so, uh, I guess I'll leave it there for now. Do you have a question? Yeah, I'm just saying, um, I have a story in the paper tomorrow after our discussion about the charter change yep. and you know, its passage through the legislature. Oh, okay, great. Okay, well, we'll look for your story on that tomorrow. Excellent, thank you. Um, so yeah, story about that and the times are, I guess, uh, coming out tomorrow. Okay, super. Hi, everybody. Um, so we had a, uh, a very successful town meeting day last week uh, on Tuesday. Um, everything went very smoothly. Um, the uh, voter participation uh, that we saw in November uh, was historic. And I, I think everywhere in Vermont, uh, despite you know the fact that uh, things like automatic voter registration and uh, same-day voter registration are really uh, increasing turnout for bigger elections, like uh, general elections in November. Uh, all of us are struggling a little bit with, you know, just ways to keep up participation uh, uh, in town meeting days in general um, on an annual basis. So I encourage any and all of you, if you have any ideas about, you know, uh, how to keep up voter participation and not even keep it up but encourage it uh, in future elections to bring it to the clerk's office, please. Um, also, on uh, the two charter changes that were uh, voted for by the citizens of Montpelier in November, uh, they passed their first two hurdles in the legislature uh, recently. Um, the uh, Legislative Council uh, did not vote them un unconstitutional, um, so we, uh, we are moving forward. Thank you so much. Great. Um, I've got a couple things. One. Um, Talk to the mayor, talk to our consultant about the strategic planning sessions on April 15th and 16th, and I think they will be very similar to last year, be evening times on Monday and Tuesday nights. The first night would be just the council. It'd be somewhat similar to what we did last year, although you recall last year we had three new council members and two people that had only been on one year, so we spent a lot of time sort of get to know you and all that. And I think we'll do that because we do have a new member, but we'll probably be a little shorter review the strategic plan we did last year, see how we want to update it, or if we want to start from scratch, those kinds of things, and maybe start putting more of the meat on the bones that first Monday night. And then that gives the staff the chance during the Tuesday day to react to that and offer comments or suggestions, those kind of things. And then Tuesday night, might have to find a better room um, than, than last year, but uh, it would be all of you with the department heads, and we're going to invite the chairs of some of the key committees so that they can be part of it, make sure we're all planning the same way and particularly since we're doing a new city plan or master plan this year um, include those so that I think that's how that's shaping up um, I, this is sort of an informational but somewhat of a question the, the uh, some of you are aware that the uh, the school has put out uh, a RFP for after school programs and our rec department has been sort of preparing one and we've been working soon I've been working with them to do that and it occurred to us as we were talking about it today that we had never actually run that up the flagpole past you folks. So um, this it's due Friday. So um, basically, this is A, informing you that we intend to do that, and B, please tell us if we shouldn't. <laughs> so, 
No, I think it's good. <laughs> um, you know, we have the we we have the facilities. They have they have a licensed daycare program now. Um, we would plan to use a lot of the same community connections people and um, have been in touch with them. Um, so we thought it would be good to have a local. Uh, the local city organization in at least making a proposal to, to give that the school board that option uh, yeah uh, I would just say knowing with young children that there's a shortage of child care available at the school and or for after school care I mean that seems like a great thing and I know there's changes happening right. at the school itself and so two thumbs up great. Cool. Uh, Bill can you go back to the retreat Monday and Tuesday. At one point, you said leave it leave the seventeenth too. Are we going to do? Yeah, I don't think we'll, I, we commission? will not be using the evening of the seventeenth. So, are we going to try to get together with the park commission through this facilitator? Maybe we should talk about. Well, I mean, I think the parks commission would be at the, or at least a representative of the parks commission would be at this the night of the sixteenth. Okay, I guess. I, I felt that we had promised a real get together with the whole council and the whole park commission when we talked with them earlier. Well, really we can do that. We, I don't know. Well, we just don't have, you know, I'm not sure what her, I think she's flying out on the 17th, so I just don't know if we would be able to do it that evening. So, unless we can do a daytime one, which I doubt. Okay. But we can schedule another one. We'd be happy to do that. We could get a different facilitator, you know, just a meeting facilitator. Well, I, I would propose that we do something. That, that yeah, we, no, we I think that's right. The whole commission and the whole council. So if it's not then, we should start scheduling the, something in. Right. Happy to do that. Was I the only one remembering that? No. Okay. No, we talked about doing that. <laughs> okay. I'm, uh, I have one more thing, just quickly. Um, we're not pushing any panic buttons, but we would say that it's supposed to warm up um, on Friday and have rain, get into the 50s. We There is a lot of snow. Um, ice is still pretty thick on the river. Uh, USGS tells us it's about one and a half feet thick, um, which can break up into big chunks. So we did have an emergency team meeting today um, call with the National Weather Service. We're doing it again Friday. We'll be sending out um, notices probably uh, from on alert, just reminding people that if you are if you have a basement that floods, you know, maybe get your stuff out. This is the time of year that these things happen. Um, of course, we, we never know. Um, the, we don't think conditions will happen this weekend, but you never know. Um, so we're, just so you know, we are in active planning mode and active uh, sort of alert and assigning people to have duty and monitoring everything that's going on. Um, like I said, we're not pushing the panic button yet, but um, people should be aware that there is a lot of snow, a lot of things that could melt the river and that there's thick ice. So we need either the snow to drop or the ice to get thinner or both our channels to open up so the ice has a place to go. So hope for good sugaring weather, warm during the day, then <laughs> night to slow things up, but then melts more <laughs> gradually. Oh, yeah, good. I have a tech question. I really appreciated Jamie posting on Front Porch Forum about Vermont Alert, mm -hmm. because some people don't realize that. But within Vermont Alert, you have to mark flooding to get some flooding announcements and alerts. Do you know for sure that when you put yours out, it doesn't go in that category? We have several. So I'd have to defer to the experts yeah, but so there, are out, several, you... there are several categories that we can choose from including like everybody okay. um, so we because we, as a user you hit transportation storms thunder right. flooding and I didn't know if right. people had to know that in order right. to get it okay so that's all I have okay uh, so we did have an anticipated uh, executive session tonight, which I believe requires two motions. Correct. I move that the council find that uh, there is an issue relating to uh, litigation that uh, premature general public knowledge would place the public body at a substantial disadvantage. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Is it possible? Uh, d if you have further comments now is a fine yeah, time. Yeah. The, the it's okay. It's okay. Um, one of them is the serious situation that the D&W construction has created. 
the drawing board, the people continuing to park next to the drawing board, and that narrow drive. And I've had to pull in there, meet an on outcoming car, have to back out into traffic. And I've seen a lot of people do that. Some people parking where they're not supposed to, blocking the drive. DNW is using way more than they need of that M&M property for snow storage and culvert pipe storage. I think it would be within our reasonable <coughs> to request they cut, make that a two lane, constrain it in so that there's two lanes. Also, the potholes are so deep, a, a wagon and horse couldn't get through there right now. Is so, that, sorry to interrupt you. I don't know um, whose land that is. Sorry? I don't know whose responsibility yeah. is to level that. Well, well, we own the land, yeah, so. So, uh, so uh, is. To drive immediately adjacent to the drawing board? Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Yeah. So it needs some attention. Okay. Secondly, the ability to feed meters when you have to climb up on a snowbank. Uh, and I did get one ticket for given, uh, but I that's challenged nice. it. Uh, I wanted that to go on record. <laughs> uh, but it should be an incentive that we, we need a clear policy on what whether meters are enforceable when you can't get to them in street shoes, you know. Um, in the ADA category that Jack mentioned, uh, our sidewalks are extremely uh, un unlevel and unsafe right now for, in a lot of places. Some of it's due to frost heat, some of it's due to age. And a, a re nearby state, I just saw somebody got a personal half a million dollar judgment from uneven sidewalks. Um, but I'd also encourage you to look up the 60 Minutes episode a few, a month or two back, where one town, an architect lost his sight after, and, and maintained his architectural practice in designing sidewalks that have the grooves so that we could become a blind friendly town to an nth degree just with textures and grooves that help people find their way around. And I think that would be a, both a smart and a constructive way to re, reclaim art. Both of those are quality of life issues mm -hmm. that I want to like you see take action on. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, cool. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jack? I move we go into executive session pursuant to 1 VSA section 313A1 for the purpose of discussing pending uh, civil litigation to which the city is a party. Second. For the discussion. Uh, before we vote, I uh, just want everybody to know that we will not be coming out to take any further action. So, um, okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. Thank you, everybody.